On this episode of Between Two Beers, we talk to Dwayne Sweeney. Sweeney is a Waikato rugby legend who has played 68 games for the Chiefs, 103 for Waikato and 97 for Morrinsville Sports. He's been a professional rugby player for nearly 20 years, spent six years playing in Japan, has represented New Zealand at secondary school, under 21, sevens and New Zealand Māori level and is still going in the grassroots game. We open this episode with Sweeney's epic emotional tale of Morrinsville's 2009 Brewery Shield win, which he described as the best of his career. We talk about the realities of making your NPC debut as a schoolboy, Gordon Titchen's insane sevens training, working out with arguably the strongest man in All Blacks history, playing against the Lions, Waikato's epic end of year pub crawls, and what a Saturday night out in Hamilton looks like for a Waikato star. Sweeney is one of my schoolboy friends, but someone I hadn't spoken to in over 15 years. He was a perfect guest, passionate, articulate, emotional and thoughtful. He's also had an incredible career, and despite the lengthy runtime in this one, I felt like we easily could have gone twice the duration. Hope you enjoy this one as much as we did. Check the Between Two Bears Facebook or Instagram page for the show notes, and you can listen to this episode on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts or iHeartRadio. Dwayne Sweeney, welcome to Between Two Beers. Thanks for having me. Very excited to have you along. I'm uh, going to talk some code tonight, Shay. It's uh, <laughs> for those rugby fans tuning in to hear Sweeney. It's, it's been traditionally a bit of a football podcast up till now, but looking forward to getting our feet wet in the in the rugby waters. Mm. Uh, I've got a very very special guest, um, Shay. How do you know Dwayne Sweeney? Um, well, we went to school together. I was a couple of years your senior. Um, and then what, I remember watching you in 2002 at the Hawks Bay game down at McLean Park and thinking, I was at school with this guy a couple of years ago. And then I think the next time we probably crossed paths was in uh, Nandi International Airport. I think he'd just finished playing New Zealand Māori um, yeah. in Lautoka. And Stephen and I were actually over there for OFC. We had a football for life thing. And you and Alad were there. And I, yeah. I'd met Alad and I spoke to Alad, but then I remember talking to you there. And then... In doing the research for this podcast, I kind of realised how much of a, a like a hardcore late nineties, early two thousands rugby fan I actually was, <laughs> even though I'm a, a football person at heart, and also like reading some of your quotes and bits and pieces, just your loyalty to the region. And I always call myself a ambassador, like I'm pro, yeah, yeah. I'm pro Hamilton. <laughs> that came through, and I thought oh, there's probably a little bit kind of closer connections than I actually realised. With Sweeney, so I'm looking forward to um to, to this to this episode. But Stephen, you're closer in age, and maybe the same year at, at Hamilton Boys. Yeah, yeah, we went to school together, uh, third form through seventh form. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, I think we played cricket together. Yeah. Did we? Yeah. yeah, Colts third and fourth form before he went his rugby way, and I went my football way. Uh, English classes. I think we sort of were in the same wider group of friends. Yeah. Um, a lot of parties, and yeah, knew Sweeney. Well, consider him a friend through high school, um, but then as you do, uh, went out different directions. I think this is the first time I've seen him in 20 mm. years. Yeah, yeah, no, it would be. Well, 18 years. 18 we, years. Since yeah. we finished school. Yeah, so uh, a <clears throat> lot of ground to catch up on. Um, I remember him being a really big deal at school. It was kind of like Sweeney in the first 15 was the big gun. It was, <laughs> you know... Sweeney and Kurt Marath and Jared Tansy and Travis Church and, and guys like that. They were like the, the core of that boys high first fifteen. I was on the I was on the soccer path, but um mutual respect I think for, for each other. Um we're gonna get into all of that, but there's a place I wanna start. Um asked a few people about you and there's a lot out there because you've had an incredible career. Um but one that people keep coming back to is you gotta to talk to him about two thousand and nine, Morrinsville. <laughs> The final, and just briefly chatting to you before the podcast, you, you mentioned it was it was one of more probably your favourite game. Um, can you run us through? I know there's a whole, a huge, incredible backstory of emotion and triumph and, and everything. So, talk us through the Brewery Shield 2009 win with Morrinsville. Yeah, um, 
Oh, I'm glad you brought that up because I still get goosebumps now uh, thinking about that. And I suppose it was it was sort of a I was it was a hard time. It was very hard. Uh, we lost our coach. Um, so yeah, I'll sort of, I'll sort of tell the story, I suppose, of how I ended up at the club and um, being a Morrinsville boy, but came across to Hamilton for high school for for better opportunities and got it. Um, you know, playing first fifteen for Hamilton Boys High was 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 awesome and it gave me a great stepping stone, I suppose, into my rugby career. Um, but I was always a Morrinsville boy at heart and I wanted to go home. Um, had heaps of offers to play club rugby here in Hamilton. Even got offered money, <laughs> a lot of money, uh, for an 18-year-old, sort of $15,000 to play club rugby. Stephen loves a money question, yeah, by the way. Yeah. So I couldn't believe it. He's like, hooked, he's hooked straight away. It's yeah, yeah. So, but um, <laughs> no, there, was, uh, there was only one place I was going, and that was, that was back home. Um, I, I did play my junior rugby for Curio. Um very famous club in Morrison. Was Buck Anderson there when you yeah, played Buck, there? Yeah, Buck. Oh, nah, nah. So, Buck, Buck was, he was my first 15 coach at Boys High. Yeah. He was... Player coach for Kiryan, got them into the um, Premier Division when he was in that role. And, but that was when we were at Ham Boys. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I, I, was, he used to I was playing for the, Hamilton Boys then when he was doing that. But yeah, yeah, the sign written car used to park, yeah, yeah, used to park yeah, yeah. at the school. Yeah, yeah, it cost Kiryan some money, but he, he, <laughs> did, he did his job. Um, but yeah, so I, I, was, I went back to Morrinsville, and the reason I played for Morrinsville Sports over Kiryan was the fact that they had a Premier site um, and they were playing in the premier division and that's where I, I needed to be to achieve what I wanted to um, so that was that became home to me um, yeah and then sort of fast forward seven years into 2009 um, being involved and so I, there was always a little window I was playing that would have been my third season of Super Rugby yeah, we actually made the final for the Chiefs that year. Got a hiding from the Bulls. Oh, in South Africa. Yeah, in South Africa, yeah. So um, there, that was, there was always a little window. Uh, that year, the window ended up being a bit bigger because there was no New Zealand Maldi tour. So normally there'd be Super Rugby, a little international window. All Blacks would obviously be a bigger window. But um, yeah, so the previous two years I played New Zealand Maldis. That year they didn't have a team. So I actually got a little bit more club rugby in. We're in the, those sort of previous two years I'd play maybe two games if I was lucky in that sort of window between Super Rugby and what it was back then the ITM Cup or well, New Zealand Cup then into the ITM Cup um, so there was a bit bigger window there so I got a couple of games in actually had a uh, when I actually missed the last round robin game which when I started those that sort of run of that window we weren't really in the picture for playoffs, but I think old boys might have might have been knocking on the door of a perfect season. And they came to Campbell Park and they found out what's up. <laughs> <laughs> Mighty Morrons will knock them off, and then um, yeah, then we we had another. I think I played two games. They missed the the last round robin game. It actually came. It was us versus Fraser Tech, uh, and that game has significance that I'll get to in a little bit of time. But so we end up. I'm I'm away, so I'm not there. I had this something planned that weekend, so I wasn't there. I was getting text updates, what not, what's going on, and then all of a sudden, Morons will win. We finished fourth, and we're into the semi-finals. And um, you know, it's a big party at the club rooms. Morons will doesn't do it sort of any other way. We're very amateur, and we enjoy many beers. Gotta celebrate um, your wins. Yeah, yeah. Gotta yeah celebrate there's you there's, no, there's not not much professionalism there in terms of uh, recovery and that sort of thing. So we definitely enjoyed the win and it was a massive party. You would have thought we'd won it then um, from the stories I hear. And then that um, get a, you know, the message that comes through on Sunday morning that Stivey, who um, was our, our head coach at the time and had connections to Fraser Tech was, you know, partied pretty hard, um, you know, and had a heart attack at the age of 43. Um, so that was a massive shock to, to, to all of us, um, you know, involved, that had been involved with Stivey and to Fraser Tech also because he did, had really strong ties to their club um, that week. I just, the, the whole week was just like all this, I don't know, uh, can't really describe it. Probably the next two weeks are a bit of a blur. Um, I remember Tuesday, we 
the funeral was on Wednesday so that we could train to prepare for um, for our semi-final on Saturday. Uh, not not that we really trained a lot now that I think back. Like, yeah, we kind of played touch and had a lot of beer. Um, we had a really good team culture and, yeah, that, that team had been together for a long time. Was, it, was there well. any thought that the semi-final wouldn't go ahead? That... Um, nah, not that... I don't, there's no way that Stivey's family would have let that happen. Like he, they, they love rugby, um, and that's they loved his part, and he would have wanted yeah. us to play. And that's what they kept saying, and that's why they said we're going to have the funeral on Wednesday, because you just need to train. Stivey would want that. Hmm. Um, so, I don't. Yeah, I can't. I don't even know if we trained Tuesday. I think we might have all got together, and Morons all we got our club rooms and downstairs we've got a yeah, our number one shed. We've got this big sort of open area that we don't use our shed on training nights. We just go in there on game day. Um, there's a big sort of open area down there that that's where we get changed and have a beer and whatnot after training. And we all sat down in there and I can't remember who initiated, but we literally just told stories of Stivey. So whether you'd met him once or been involved with them for a few years everyone sort of started sharing and it was to start with someone would share and you know there'd be tears and it would go quiet for sort of 10-15 minutes and there'd be a bit of laughter because someone would say something funny and yeah it was really and we were there for hours like yeah it was really late late into the morning and then we had the funeral the next day and um yeah so then we trained Thursday and same thing we literally played some touch come back, shared a few more stories, had a couple of beers. And then we, I had to play um, for Waikato on the Friday, so we played Auckland. The season sort of crossed over and it was a real debate. They didn't want me playing. Um, Morrinsville? Nah, Waikato didn't. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, because I'd had a really big workload with Super Rugby. Yeah. Um, so I played a lot of game time, so they were trying to limit my game time in that, in that sort of club window, pre-season window, yeah. to freshen me up for what well, must have been the ITM Cup then. Um, yeah, so I remember going in and sitting with the coaches, talking to them about it. They talked from, obviously, the professional side, but they were both rugby men. Um, Is it Chris Gibbs? Was yeah, he? Chris Gibbs and Coaching? Scott McLeod yeah. were coaches. Um, and they had the trainers there, and doctors there, etc., talking about the medical side and the workload and this and that and they said okay look you can play but you know you, you can you can come off the bench we're going to limit your time um you're going to play you're going to start on friday against auckland we'll try and get you off at half time um but there's no guarantees that we can um but you can come off the bench so i was like okay cool so we go up to play Auckland. I play whole, the whole 80 minutes. Um, I don't think they were ever going to uh, sort of take me off, and I think they kind of did that to limit my involvement on Saturday. Um, we come down. So I turn up on Saturday, and Ski Waiseki Masarewa was the assistant coach, and he'd taken over and sort of stepped in to, to well, to the our solo coach. Um, and I walked up to him, and he goes, oh, sweet, yeah. how long do you want to play half time okay I was like nah fuck that I'm starting and he's like okay <laughs> and he goes just so you know I didn't tell you to start I was like yeah, yeah that's alright so sweet ass um, so we start warming up and so there's no doubt in your mind there you was no doubt there was no game. doubt that you know it, even the fact that we made the semi-final take the take the whole emotion side out with Stivey like this was my town my club that I was, you know, I, I when I started, we used to get our ass kicked, like 80 points. If there was The top four teams would put 80 on us, week in, week out. And it was like that for, until then, pretty much. Like, even a couple of years before, like, you know, we'd I'd turn up on sad days and we, we struggled. We were just, you know, we, didn't have, we had good numbers, but, you know, we've probably enjoyed the social side of it a bit too much, but... We just didn't have the depth or the, you know, guys aspiring to, you guys come into the region for Super Rugby or whatever it may be, or um, a chance to play for Waikato. They go to Old Boys, they go to Fraser Tech, they go to Hamilton Marist, and, 
you know, they, they can be centralised in Hamilton then. They don't have to travel out yeah. to Moronsville to training or to Tiamuda or wherever it may be. So, you know, we, we didn't get a lot of guys from outside come and play. Like, um, and then to put it into context, are there any other Waikato players playing club rugby the next day after playing? Um, or is it like you're the only one who's like, I'm, I'm definitely playing this game? Yeah, I was the only one that pl- as it started. A couple of the other boys played for Fraser Tech. Yep. But they didn't play 80 minutes on Friday either. They played 10, 15. Mm-hmm. They had a lot of, like, Fraser Tech had, um, like, Fra- yeah, Old Boys had, I'm just trying to think, did Old Boys have many? Yeah, I think Old Boys, they limited the players that played on Friday for Waikato because Old Boys had been winning all year. They'd only lost to us. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, we turned up. It might have been two, three weeks, three about three weeks later, and it, no, four had never been in one either, in what in Brewer Shield history. So you're playing old boys in the semi. Yeah, we're playing old boys in the okay. semi at, at um, Fred Jones and at old boys, and one uh, four had never been in one in Brewer Shield history. It's happened again since, but up until then, it never happened. Um, yeah, and it was. I remember. I remember. Glimpses of the game, like it was very emotion driven. Um, there was a bit of there was a fight. Um, I I scored a try. Their captain Adam Cathcart, ex, ex Hamilton Boys High yeah. boy as well. Um, so I scored, and he tackled me as I went over. And just so it turned out that when I scored, I slammed the ball down right beside his head. He was on his back, mm-hmm. and then it was right in front of like the old boys club rooms end. And there's that sort of step up to the yeah. car park there, and. We had a lot of Morrisville supporters there, and they were all cheering, and it was like it just erupted, and I think the emotion got the better of him. And he grabbed the ball as I was getting up and just biffed it straight in my face, and I was like, "Here we go!" Like it's all on. I basically went to punch him in the face, and I was on the ground about five meters behind. My brother had actually grabbed me because he saw it happen, grabbed me, threw me out, jumped over, and he was into him. So, oh, shit. yeah, it was a lot of, oh, it was a lot of, it's rugby, you know, physical sport, a lot of emotion. and But also with something like that, I imagine it's mm. a lot of frustration bubbling over yeah. at the events, and it just yeah. it needs to come out in yeah, some way. Yeah, so, it yeah. does, yeah, yeah. Us, yeah, there was a lot of emotion in all of us, and then I think old boys felt, you know, I, I, I can't speak for his state of mind, but maybe they felt that, uh-oh, like here we go again like they had i don't think yeah i think they'd had a few bit of trouble in the semi-finals in sort of previous years they hadn't won it for Mm. a few years considering how strong they were so yeah there might have been a bit of that sort of deep down frustration i guess and then we end up it ends up coming down to the wire and and like i said i wasn't meant to start and we were down by two points i think it was I can't remember the score, but we were down by two. And then we was maybe six minutes to play. Not even that. Um, and I get subbed, and I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm walking off, and I'm looking at Sam. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, this one of the under-21s players that was filling in comes on. It's like, Swinsbury, you're off. And I'm like, what? I am not off. Like, you like, can't take me off. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, no, bro, you got to go off. And I look to the bench thinking, what is going on? And there's the two Waikato coaches standing with oh. skis. And I'm like, oh, uh-oh. I'm going to hear about this one on Monday. So I, anyway, go off. And I'm not happy. I'm not, and I make that very visual that I'm not happy. I'm kicking water bottles over. And it, in the end, we, we, we force a penalty. Um, Brooke Tremaine kicks the, kicks the penalty. Um, and then we, we take a one, I think it was a one point or two point win and then we move into the final and we're like so four's been in one for the first time ever and um i've backed up 80 minutes with 74 minutes when i wasn't really meant to is is the emotions all coming out again at the final oh yeah yeah that was like you know that like the i suppose the game against fraser tech probably in the last round robin game probably got us ready for like playoff footy because it was all or nothing then and we win it in the last play. Then we do it again in the semi-final. So we're in this playoff situation for a week longer than probably most teams are. Well, we had another week of it, or a week earlier than old boys did. And it's just the field gets swarmed. It's like it's like we've won um, the whole thing. And um, 
so then we party real hard that <laughs> night <laughs> and it's like you think oh shit like we've made the made the final like uh oh let, you know so let's you're going focus back oh, we're going back to morals yeah, yeah. We, we go to the club rooms and, yeah and we're, we're back at the club rooms and we have a we have a big night and you know it's, i go i go in and now i'm real sore sunday because i've played mm. two games back, back to back and then had a big night on the beers and i go in on monday and uh, normally a monday for us and like is generally in the morning it's a bit of it's more sort of review uh we normally start with some sort of you know sort of conditioning whether it's weights first and then guys that didn't play too much will have a bit of a tickle up of off feet conditioning or maybe they'll go outside and do some running um and then so I, we go and get our weights done and i've played two games so i'm sore and i'm like oh yeah that's all right i won't have to do the running mm-hmm. session today then the names go up on the board oh these boys are outside for running my name's on there and i'm like <laughs> okay yeah they're, they're not happy with me the fact they've played so i go out there and i'm into it and i'm go, giving it everything i can trying to stay at the front trying to make it like you're not going to break me sort of scenario then we have a little normally a bit of a lunch window in the middle of the day the coach has asked to see me so we go into the office they tell me to sit down i refuse to sit down <laughs> i'm like nah <laughs> what do you want to say and then they're they're into me about basically um going against their word and, and this and that and i stood there and i took it um and i didn't say nothing didn't say nothing i just sort of went with it and then i just hit a point and pretty much snapped and was like no what would you have done and and a lot different words than that like it's very emotion emotional thing i'm pretty sure i was crying and swear words coming out i was not happy i was just like what would you have done in my situation and then both of them sort of took their coach's hat off and then they looked at it from my point of view and boy up till then you know they they i think they might have been new coaches too like that was stormy's mm. first job mm, yeah. as assistant coach and Chris Gibbs might have been his first year as head, so... Yeah, he took over from yeah, Tony Hanks the Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was, you know, they were probably new to this, this, you know, I suppose managing a team and trying to get and a team how, ready. How old are you at this point? Uh, I would have been 25. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I've been... I was a 50 gamer. Like, I've played, yeah, probably 50, 60 games for Waikato yeah. at that stage. Um, so I was a senior player. I was in the leadership group and... And that sort of thing, and that was a lot of the frustration from them is that you're a leader in this team, and you. What are the rest of your teammates saying? Are they? All oh, they didn't same? care. They yeah. wanted to see us win. Like yeah. you know, well, everyone but old boys wanted us to win. Yeah. And then that next week, everyone wanted us to win except Tech. So, because and I was the only one. I was the only player in that group that, um, well, yeah, that was in, that was playing for Morinsville because Brendan Leonard was in the All Blacks at the yeah. time. So, um yeah so yeah and then they sort of that sort of ends so we have this big argument about it and it ends and we get on with the week as normal and then we go the team gets named to play Tanaki on the friday and we play down in um in Harwater. and then yeah so and this is an official first class game so it's not a pre-season because against Tanaki we always we play for the Ryan Wheeler Memorial yeah. Trophy, and always in preseason. Back then, it used to be a first class official game, so you only strip twenty two. It was I'm pretty sure it was twenty two then, not twenty three. So you just strip the twenty two. So this is like the Waikato team that gets named for this one. This is the final. Basically, this is a dress rehearsal for round one in a week's time. Um, I had named to start a game, and then same thing, eighty minutes, and then they were. They said, oh, you know, guys that are involved today that are involved in the club club final, we will make those decisions tonight after the game on how that goes, whether you can play. A um, couple of the Fraser Tech boys couldn't play uh, just because we lacked depth for Waikato in those positions, so it was too risky for them to play. Um, and I remember the what the coaches just said oh look you do what you need to do and you just look this is ski for morons and he's like you just and the players they're like i said i can't let you i can't tell you what i can or can't do this week um i think i'm pretty we went to new Plymouth on thursday so i missed our final training on thursday night and then we played friday and then we bust back and we got to i remember we pulled in the stadium and it was like quarter to one in the morning 
and I'd get off the bus and get my bags and still, still no, nowhere, still nothing, no nothing. Like <laughs> I, walk, I've, I purposely walked up and down the bus, like walking past the coaches. <laughs> like. And, and last preseason game before the season mm. starts, mm. are there beers on the bus on the way mm. back or it's dry bus? Nah, pretty much. Yeah, oh, we might have one or two. Yeah. And the change shed probably, but probably not on the bus. Yeah. Like, yeah. Especially with the club final being the next day and if you guys been involved in that. Um, so we get there and I'm getting my bag off. It's still nothing. And I walk, walk past the coaches, like, with my bag, nothing. Walk to my car, <laughs> put it in the car, and then I walk around, open the driver's door, and I'm just standing there, but my heart's just, like, sunk. I'm like, I... I wanted this moment for so long you know and it, the extra added emotion of our, of our coach passing and wanting to do that do it for him and then i get swings and i like, oh, look up like a little kid at christmas and they call me over and i'm just like oh and i was like this is not i'm still this is not going to be good though like um and they said oh do you want to play tomorrow and i was like fucking a on play <laughs> and they're like yeah we knew you'd say that and that does so it was um chris gibbs that asked the question and then scott mccarthy goes i knew you'd say that sort of grinned and they said you can play and i was like yes and they're like but you're on the bench and you're not allowed on before half time and they're like can you promise us that and i was like yeah i can promise that so i rung straight away rung ski at like here yeah, one in the or quarter to one in the morning or whatever it was and he answers and then He's, I think he was having beers, he was a bit nervous. <laughs> and then uh, he's like, yeah. I was like, yeah, I can play. And he's like, cool, you can start. And I was like, no, 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 I'm not allowed to start. I have to come off the bench. And he's like, okay. Um, yeah, and then I suppose it's like it's more the story, really getting to the game is probably the, the real cool bit because the game was just, it was it was awesome. Like, we played really well. Um, there was, and I suppose... You think about my career at that point, like I'd played, I might, yeah, I might have been, yeah, I was close to the 50 Super Rugby games. I played 50 games for Waikato, so nearly 100, or probably 100 first class games of rugby because I've played Maldives for two years and New Zealand Sevens, New Zealand Colts, and that was like, and still to this day, that was the greatest game that I ever played and but i had very little involvement as well i, I was a reserve yeah. um i think i went on for a blood bin in the first half like for the last five minutes maybe touched the ball once or twice and came back off and then went back on sort of i don't know maybe ten, five ten minutes into the second half and didn't do a lot like i kicked a drop goal which was ugly it was just <laughs> like it was like a dead duck and but it went over um they kicked the missed a couple of penalties couple of shanks um yeah didn't do a lot didn't didn't make any breaks really didn't didn't have a real big influence on the game i was i don't know the guys might say different just the fact that i was there but the team played so well and that was a real satisfying thing and the fact that it was all that emotion driven and and the fact that morinsville mm yeah could win a title was like even if you had asked us five weeks earlier four weeks earlier mm. even before that semi-final before the semi-final probably a little bit more belief because of what we'd done to old boys and tech leading in um but yeah if you go back to before like we had not really played that well but we're sort of there or thereabouts and then we just clicked and we just got on this roll and away we went. And what was, sort of what sort of crowd are you getting to that final? Is it oh, like five deep on the sidelines? Is it the whole? No, nah, so we played there? at um we played at the stadium. Yeah, oh, right. so the club final was at the stadium, and I did, I don't know what the attendance was, but they they only opened the one stand, the main stand, but it was like full yeah. pretty much. Yeah, every man and his dog. Yeah, there was I think there was in. like double digits of buses went from Morrinsville, like sort of a dozen, fifteen buses. Of people like these, like if you weren't working or on the farm, yeah. <laughs> you were at, you were in a bus and you had a Morals of Sports jersey on or t-shirt or something, and yeah. and they were there, and that was a cool, real cool part too. The day they did that really well, so we met at um, we met at Campbell Park at the club rooms, and all of a sudden like people just start turning up, so they'd organised all the buses to leave from there too. Um, but there was like the the game's not till I think we played it maybe six o'clock, 
mm. at night, 5.30 or 6. Um, we would have been there at 2 or 3, and there was hundreds of people there. And we're like, what? <laughs> and they just got more and more. So we're like, man, this is like a bit much. So we went down into the changing shed, and we just sort of hung out in there and stretched and talked and was it the biggest day relaxed. in Lawrenceville's history until Jacinda Ardern became Prime Minister <laughs> yeah yeah for, I think it still might be <laughs> we might still have her on that one <laughs> she's probably there yeah, yeah she might have been there but, uh, um, but we um, yeah and then we, I remember we, we just sort of locked ourselves away we're like wow, this is getting a bit too much like it was a bit too much emotion flying mm. around and then all of a sudden we came out to get on the bus and it was like thousands of people <laughs> and it was like what like because they just kept coming and they're all everyone's there and they're having beers and you know everyone's full of excitement there's flags there's banners there's everything and we walk out to this like thunderous like ovation getting on the bus and there's all these people and photos and yeah it was like i'd you know you, you sort of i'd sort of seen that before but only really in south africa mm. like playing against south african teams it's what's like when you turn up to a ground and it's just yeah. thousands of people there and you come off the bus and it's more abuse that gets thrown at you there rather than support but no doubt that's you know the, what the home team feels when they when they, so i hadn't experienced that from a home point of view mm. um but yeah it was it was amazing with with so much emotion flying around with with Stivey, how much did you use that in sort of pre-match team talks and did you address it was it constantly a theme that you used to nah so we did yeah we never spoke about it which was there yeah, that was probably the key we didn't speak about it in terms of the game so it wasn't like we're out there in a moment and we'd be like let's do this for Stivey because it was just there and we were doing it we we did that you know, we had our share moments, like what, what I spoke about earlier, in terms of in the shed, sitting down, talking, share our moments that we had with Stivey, funny stories, whatever. So that was like our emotion, but it was like sort of di almost disconnected from the game. Yeah. We just let our natural sort of emotions take over. Mm -hmm. And that was probably what worked for us. Because it was there, like yeah. you could see it. Like we were... There'd be moments, um, like in huddles, and you look across, and we're 30 minutes into a game, and someone would have tears, and you'd know exactly what that was. Yeah. He wasn't sore. Like, you know, yeah. it was just, he was having a yeah. moment, and whatever it may be, I I experienced a couple of them at certain times in the semi-final, and again in the final. And the final was more, more around the time when I knew we had won. Yeah. <laughs> there was, because I was lucky enough that I... We got a penalty and we, um, I, I lined it up and then the ref's watch beat and I said, is that time? And he's like, yeah. So I knew before I kicked the ball that that was it and everyone else, like no one else knew, none of the other players knew, I was standing next to the, to the ref. So it goes over because the clock was out too. The <laughs> clock had still showed a little bit of time, not much, but the boys are probably thinking, oh, we've got to get the kick off. So I kicked this kick over and I'm running around like cheering and the boys are like trying to run back to halfway <laughs> and I'm trying to hug them and they're like, what? And then the ref, because he wait, he gives it a delay before he double whistles it. So, yeah. And then he sort of double whistles it and some of the guys are still trying to get back to halfway. and Yeah, yeah we, but I, yeah, it was pretty, uh, like just that moment of, of asking him and him saying yes and just knowing make sure you kick it dead so it doesn't don't yeah. miss the post don't and you come back in the way. um but yeah once i kicked it and it wasn't it was yeah it wasn't a hard kick but i've definitely missed the easier ones though mm. um but it didn't have a bearing on whether we won or not as long as i kicked it dead so that play was over yeah yeah and then final whistle sounds and then what big oh, dog pile yeah. yeah so the yeah massive dog pile so there was this big i remember hearing the announcers over the speaker like all everybody stay off the field not on the field because we're playing there next week for Waikato and you can't touch the magic grass um, yeah. even though when we were kids we used to run on there all yeah. the time like yeah, yeah so I, I just remember that I have a memory of, of that coming over and making is that in a head too or are people just going on oh it, and as soon as the I'm pretty sure dad was probably on the first ones <laughs> over and my brothers reckon that he was. They reckon he was just standing there ready to go. Soon there's a, some security guards there and they're like, you guys can't get on. And dad's like, 
fuck you, get out of the way. I'm going. He jumped over and, yeah, my brothers all followed and, yeah, everyone was there and it was, yeah, it was, yeah, it was crazy, crazy moment. Yeah. Like, yeah. Something that'll, you know, that'll stay with me forever. And then you've built this up. You've had these amazing series of wins where you've mm. had these huge parties afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> How do you trump that? Is it just the same as the week before? Everyone back to the Morrinsville Club? Yeah, yeah. No, the... Yeah, the club rooms went real well that night. So that was, that's another sort of leads into another, I suppose, sort of moment in the, in what sort of the week happened. So we have like what we call the Mulu Open Day where mm. like where they open up the stadium normally. Um, and then all the kids come and you, you, we have a whole lot. The players, we set up a whole lot of, you know, like little games of ripper rugby, high ball catching, running races and all sorts. And the players all get involved and they, they normally launch the team poster and face painting and all of that. So that's... Tell me that's not on Sunday. That's on Sunday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so here I am, the only one. And I'm thinking, they're surely going to let me have this day off. <laughs> And then we're in the sheds and I'm still, like, we're walking out to the bus and I've still got my plane kit on. I haven't taken my boots off yet. And then um, the boys all changed on the buses hours after the game. We were kicked out of the stadium to start with. And then, um, so we're walking out and then, yeah, the coaches go, oh, we'll see you in the morning, eh, Dwayne? 8.30? And I'm like, uh, and they're like, no, we'll see you in the morning. And they said, we don't care what state you're in, you are there. And I was like, Just okay. Just yeah, just front up. So I'm like, okay, it's green light. I'm going for it. I'm, yeah. yeah, so we had a huge I was awesome. Like, because I've got a real good close group of friends from home as well that don't play rugby. So, and they were a massive part of it too. They were a big part of my whole career. Like, they came to all my games, um, mm. you know, especially when we didn't have um, like wives and kids and stuff. Mm. But, you know, we just call ourselves, there's three of us, Adam, Adam, and myself, um, Adam, Norman, and Adam Stewart. So they were Norman, Stu, and like all the Waikato boys knew them and, and everything. Because they, they were just there, they were almost like our mascots. And they, you know, they had a big part in, you know, sort of what had happened being from Morrinsville and that. So we had a big night together and I think mum came and got me off Stu's couch. Um, I remember she went to my house on the way home and I was living in Flagstaff at the time. <clears throat> He got my Waikato polo and stuff for me uh, for the next day, knowing full well that I wouldn't be going home before going there. And um, she had it ready for me, and she picked me up from uh, from Stu's couch at must have been about eight o'clock. And we were still still having a few drinks then, and yeah. <laughs> so I get over there, and I've been you know pretty confident and pretty happy with what we've done. I walk in with my medal on, being the only one that was there so that yeah, was a pretty nice. satisfying moment so we had a team meeting at 8 30 first because they get a briefing and everything like that so i walk in and sit down and i've got my medal on and the, <laughs> all the tech boys weren't happy but they were all a bit dusty too good thing is you probably weren't hung over right eh? you were still drunk oh yeah, yeah i was, was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah i was yeah i was very i was um it was a hard case because like a few parents and that obviously been at the game the day before and they're like, oh, it's funny to see you here. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you'd still be celebrating and then they get a bit closer and be like, oh, maybe he is still celebrating. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's stay with Morrinsville before we run away because it seems to be a big part of your makeup and your your culture. So did, is it true you, post Super Rugby, you've signed a contract to go to Japan, Yep. played your last game for the Chiefs at Super Rugby, you play one more game for Morins before before you fly over? I think I played four. Oh, okay. Mm. So still, so again, yeah. you've signed a pro deal in Japan, you're going there, but Morinsville's still... Yeah, I actually, um, my agent spoke to me about it. No, he knew what I was going to do, <laughs> but he was like, I have to tell you that if you get injured, your contract will be gone. Yeah. And I was like, I'm playing. He goes, I know that you're going to play, but I'm just, then you know what the scenario is that if you go and get a major injury, because you're cleared now, of super injury, you've done your medical. So you're, you're on a plane, you're into Japan and you know, a month's time or whatever it was. So yeah, but yeah, I played. Jeez, that's a risk, isn't yeah. it? It was a risk, but it was, it was an easy decision because I was, the only reason I was there was because of Morinsville. Yeah. Really, you know, everything starts somewhere, yeah. and it was like, well, I play this game for a living, like it's a game, and it's fun and enjoyable, and there's nothing more fun and enjoyable than at amateur level for me. Like I play with a lot of pro guys that hate it, 
because mm. it's shit fields, it's muddy, if you feel slow, and, and it is, it's hard, it's cold, no one watches, but that's why I play, that's why you start playing, so why go away from that, and that's probably what's kept me in the game so long, is that I still really enjoy it. So, so if we didn't have COVID, would you be lacing up for sports again? No, I am. You yeah. are? They so are yeah. how far off the season are we? Uh, we had there. our first training tonight. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. so... We officially start training, can start training tonight, the yeah. clubs here in the Waikato, and then we are three weeks away from round, from a pre-season game, yeah. and then round one's a week later, so and four how weeks off. And how close to 100 games for more? Three. Three, three games. Three games. Because that, oh, I guess there'd be a few oh, it happens club, club footy players. Yeah, yeah, it happens, like at Morinsville, there's not many. Morinsville's an amalgamated club, so there's, oh, maybe a dozen, I'm going to say. Yeah. This, I'm just trying to picture the, the, the board. honours board. Yeah, the honours board. And it's quite a cool little ritual because it's not something... The club didn't have all these traditions because it's only, what is it now, 24 years old. So 96 oh, yeah. was the amalgamation uh, between Morons uh, or Maris and St. Joseph's and Morons or Old Boys. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's like a blazer at 60 games which was bought in and... You know, when they made that a thing, there was already a heap of guys that had played well over that, so they got presented that, and there's been a few honourable ones given to, I suppose, long servants, managers and things like that. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, the 100 games. Uh, yeah, there's... Yeah, may, maybe... Might be double figures. Yeah, I'm just trying to picture it in my head, but it's quite cool because, yeah, they do a little plaque with your name on it, and when you when you get it, you go up in front of the club and you smack it on the board. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's quite a, quite a cool, quite a cool moment that hopefully I'll be able to smack my name up there. So hundred games for Waikato or hundred plus, yeah. uh, ninety seven for Morinsville. You're talking when you're talking about the story about going to Japan but playing one last game. <laughs> Me as someone who got injured through my whole career it would be very easy i think i did my hamstring about 15 times across the course of the career so it's like any game is a real risk for injury yeah chase compiled this impressive four page list of notes in here it says that you've had an incredible run without getting injured like you've basically never got injured across your career serious injury yeah i've i've had a i had a couple of major ones like 2017 I did what Dan Carter did at the World Cup so I tore my adductor off my pelvis the tendon yeah that seems quite serious yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dodgy and it was like no that's at the end that's 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 sorry not at yeah, the end of the career yeah, yeah. that's later in <laughs> yeah the later yeah it is later so I had I think the longest or the oh, I suppose the worst injury I'd have prior to that was I broke that bone that's in my hand cool. yeah that's and cool. I, I missed one game so yeah, there you go. So what do yeah. you credit that to? Are you taking really good care of your body? Are you stretching every day? Are you looking um, to take care of yourself, or is it the Sweeney jeans you've just been? I think I've been. Care? I think I'm very lucky with jeans. Like there has to be something to that because I got other mates that have had major knee trouble or ankle, and it just seems to it, like they do the smallest thing and it happens. So that's got to be some genetic makeup or you know no concussions it seems crazy nah right? nah so very lucky touch wow. wood yeah <laughs> you're, a head, you're, a head, you're not a head gear nah nah I'm not a head gear I've had over 100 stitches in my head though yeah. so I've had my fair share of wax but yeah just mustn't be much in there <laughs> 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 yeah. but now nah, I've been I don't know I suppose I maybe the sort of concussion side of it I play the game a little bit different than sort of most people and probably what my size is as well like you know I'm quite a big guy and I've got bigger like as I've got older I've just naturally got bigger and mm. it's like yeah you know people say it all the time oh you put on weight you put on weight you put on weight and it's like yeah but I'm not doing anything different I'm just literally I don't know whether my body's just adapted to you know evolution or whatever it may be because i run into people all the time i've just got mm. i've got massive wrists and all you know big bum and everything but it's just yeah, yeah. you know it works still like it, it functions well it's i'm not as fast as or as fit as i used to be but i'm 35 now i can play golden oldies rugby but i can i'm still you know at my 10 cup level and got called into the chiefs last year super rugby mm. i didn't play but 
I was still there. They were still considering me. So, yeah, it's it's. I've just been they've been lucky, but I I credit a lot of it probably to balance. Like I figured out pretty early, and it was those two guys. So Norman, Stu, Adam, and Adam. They. I remember I might have been about twenty one, maybe. Yeah, so I'd sort of been playing for Waikato for, I was 17 when I debuted, so I was still at Boys High, that's a, that's another cool story, but yeah, there's, we'll get, yeah, we'll get, there. we'll get there, but we, um, yeah, so, like, I remember I got to about 21, and they were all sort of flatting together, and they were up to, you know, just being boys at 21, and they rode dirt bikes, and well, Adam, or well, Norm did, and then, you know, sort of Stu tagged along, I'd go watch when I could, and and whatnot but they just had heaps of fun and i kind of got stuck in this like i'm a professional rugby player i'm real serious to do this this and this and they just said to me one day like stop being a fucking dickhead bro like hang out with the boys and i kind of took that to heart like i I, i'm a pretty emotional sort of guy and you know I, i take things like that to heart and i was just like fuck am i a dickhead and i started like second guessing myself but all it was is that i was distanced i distanced myself from them because they were having a whole heap of fun and here i was trying to you know make super rugby and mm. um you know new zealand colts new zealand sevens and all this and i'm just that's what i want to do and then i was actually getting to a point it was probably getting to a point where i was gonna burn out mm. and probably hit a big flat spot i suppose and who knows what might have happened but then i was kind of figured i was like I need to get the boat best of both here because I could kind of see the unhealthiness of just hanging out with all my rugby mates all the time because you're only an injury away from not being in that circle yeah. and then that that circle don't stop you know people come and go I'd seen it happen already at that stage I was like you know people are in and then your mates 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 and then they're gone and then it's like it's not that you don't want to see them anymore it's that you can't because mm. you're that busy and mm. you're here there and everywhere so I was like, I need to try and, so when I got my time free, you know, most of the boys will go play, you know, the rugby boys will go play golf together or um, go on holiday together, whatever it may be, I would go the other way and I'd be like, nah, spend enough time with views, I'm going out with my mates from home and I think it was a good balance and it, you know, that sort of training, well, you know, when I'm there and it's rugby mode, I'm boots on, it's rugby, but when I'm not there, I'm not. I'm not sort of too worried about the fact that you got to be this percent body fat. You got to be this when you get back. It's like I'll deal with that when I get there. And you know, it's probably you know, train all my trainers will probably say it's like I oh, always turns up, you know, pretty rough neck. But I will work my ass off to get it back. But I would rather do that than constantly work. Yep. And that's probably something that's helped me stay in the game a bit longer too. Because I've seen a lot of guys that. And I did it when I was younger, like just train the house down in the off season. And I see it now, it's probably worse now. Like the young guys train harder out of season than they do in. Mm. And I'm just like, you guys have got it back to front. Like if you want a long career, you got to slow down. Like they're like, oh no, but I'll get passed by. It's like, no, once you're in, you're in. You'll, you know, you'll, you'll get yourself out and you'll know when you've gone too far or you've let yourself go too much. But there's... Yeah, it has to be a How, sort of balance. I guess lots of players are probably built for a shorter career, either mm. if their position is yep, speed-based yep. or whatever it is. Um, it seems to me that, and I'd be interested to know how you've managed to stretch it out so far. Like You said you're not as quick as you used to be. Mm. So how has your game changed? How have you been able to still be so important that you're sort of in the frame of the Chiefs yeah. as, as late as last year? Um, I think probably... So I've kind of done full circle the back line. So I'm, mm. I've gone, I started, you know, as I, you know, way back as sort of first five, sort of second five. Um, always loved my kicking and stuff like that. So I practiced that heaps. And um, then I sort of went to boys high and I got a bit of speed. Like I, I 
was somewhere, you know, like you, I, you're like a 200 meter. Yeah. Yeah. Was yeah that was yeah, your yeah, distance. Yeah. Hey? That was my distance. Was like... And I don't know why, because <laughs> like, I honestly don't know why. Cause like my genetic makeup, like if you look at me, you'd think I like, have like if, pa- powerful. Yeah. Yeah. If he bit, is gonna, so. Yeah. If he's going to be good, it'll be 10 meters, not yeah. 200. People don't but... think that I'm a 200 meter. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were 1500. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, but yeah, for some reason it just suited me and I don't know what it was, but it was the bend, I think, because I was really fast on the bend. I remember it so, so vividly. Yeah, yeah like, that I bend. would get these, like, huge leads, like, mm. yeah, sort of through... Um, and I remember I only did it because... Oh, I can't remember. Maybe my PE teacher or something. It was Mr. Symes, maybe, or <laughs> Mr. Hay. Good name. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they dared me to do the 200 or something and the things are at lunch and I went and did it and I just sort of didn't really go that hard but you know went through the first qualifications or whatever and then on athletics day we're like rock up to the heat and I'm like oh I'll give this a go no spikes spikes. no no bare feet bare feet I was yeah (laughs) didn't have spikes and then um yeah I just athletics day and this was like intermediate boys too so I must have been what would that be fourth fifth one yeah hmm yeah, yeah, juniors yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, th- is third A, and then fourth, fifth intermediate, and then senior. <sighs> Going back a long way. Something yeah, like that. Something eh? like that. Yeah. yeah I, cool. never and, went, I never went. I never went to. Yeah, you were leaving the hucker at Swimming School. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit, that's nice. <laughs> Shot put, maybe. Yeah, no, that was tennis <laughs> four, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, and I just went real well, and I was like, oh shit, I won by you know good sort of five six meters, I think my heat, and I was like, oh. Oh, there was a fluke man at a slow heat, then semi, the same thing, and then come to the final, and I was like, oh, what do I do? Like, because I was just going all out, but <laughs> fading big time, <laughs> and I was just like, oh well, like it, it seems to work, and I used to like the inside lanes because basically, you know, as the stagger unfolds, that if you if you can pass people on the bend, yeah. then you're going to be well ahead by the time the stagger unfolds. So I think in the final, I must have been in lane. I must have been in one of the middle lanes because I won my semi-final, but I just remember about halfway around the bend and there was no, everyone outside me was behind me. And then I'd yeah, come off the bend and I was way in front and faded big time, but I yeah, sort of did enough over that first hundred to it, get it. It and just defies logic. You must have been, without any disrespect, you must have been the heaviest 200 oh, meter yeah, champion. Yeah, you know? definitely. You see, this definitely. guy, you were such a powerful schoolboy. You like yeah. to say, big bum, big arms, big yeah, chest. Yeah. And you just see this sort of big barrel tummy. of a man just... <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> rolling down the track. Yeah. <laughs> but you'd think, you know, forty meter, sixty oh, meter, hundred yeah. meter would have been your distance. But yeah. for some reason, the 200... yeah. But see, the hundred, I was no good. Like, and but it was the hundred meters. The first hundred of the two hundred was where I won the race. But the hundred meters, I was no good, and I it must be the bend, like it must be that lean or something. Mm. And maybe that's from rugby. I don't know. Got to swerve or whatever it may be. But yeah. yeah. Well, we're at boys' high, so we may as well stay there then. Yeah. Um, when I was at school, or when I was, so I'm a little bit advanced of you guys. I remember you at school though. Yeah. So, so I left in '99. That was my seventh. Oh, yeah, that was so my, my seventh form. Oh yeah, that's my fourth form. Yeah. Yeah. So I think yeah. you played first fifteen the following year, maybe. Mm. So the first fifteen when I was at school for fifth, sixth, and seventh form were terrible. We weren't even the best in Hamilton. I think St Paul's used to dust us. Same with me. Um, and what? Yeah. What, what, so was it an unspectacular? Yeah, it was, for you, for yeah, you well. yeah. So we, but there's some big names that have come out of that. Oh, huge, yeah, that really group. big names. Yeah, and like so, my first 2000 was my first year, and that was when David Johnson went down the road and went to St Paul's. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So who's the first person I ever marked for the first 15? Yep. So as a fifth former, right? as a fifth former. Yeah. yeah. So I was 15 at the time, and he was the current he New was, Zealand New Zealand secondary schools. Yeah, New Zealand secondary schools. So he played in year 12 or sixth form back yeah, then yeah. as well so did you play New Zealand secondary school I did yeah in yeah. seventh form or in seventh form yeah 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 so I here I am I, I played one game for the second 15 we played St. Peter's I think on the field three out the back at boys high then the next and I got player of the day then the next week they used to how it used to work at boys high the first and seconds were trained together yeah. on a tuesday and thursday not like they do now like eight times a week or whatever they do but 
they would they put the team sheets up. Yeah, next to the uniform yeah, shop. Yeah, next to the uniform shop there <laughs> yeah. in the in the foyer. And That's by right. where all the cool seven formers used to sit, well, just was outside the, the door. That was I the, think you were right. No, there. I, was at the, I was on the backfield playing. Oh, touch. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but nice. That's where all the first fifteen guys used yeah, to be. Yeah, used to be. Yeah. And then um, I think when we were like third, fourth form, we used to sit on the, under the balcony. Eh? That's right. Yeah, we were yeah. always sort of hung around there. But then um, I remember going up, and I'm like, oh yeah, cool. Like look, and I'm looking at the sheet, and I'm like. I didn't. I didn't get name. I'm a second, and, yeah, second I was looking at the second fifteen sheet, and I'm just like, oh man, I'm like gutted. I'm like walking off, and I'm like, oh, what am I going to tell my dad? He's going to be spewing because I got man the match last week, and I'm not even playing. I didn't even look at the first fifteen sheet. I walked off, and I'm walking <laughs> down the stairs past the first fifteen guys, and um, Greg Wells. Greg Wells. I was, was going to yeah. say it was Greg. So Greg here's Wells his boy and yeah. the captain at the time. And I walk down the stairs and Wellesley comes over and shakes my hand. And then um, he was like, well done, mate. And I was just like, what? And he's like, you're starting. And I was like, mate, I'm not even playing. <laughs> and he's like, what do you mean you're not playing? You're starting. Go have a look at the sheet. And I was like, I did. I'm not even on the reserves. And he was like, what? What are you talking? And he took me in there. And he's like, look, is that your name? And I'm like, oh, I didn't look at that sheet. I was looking at the second <laughs> thing. And I like straight away was shitting myself <laughs> this is thursday lunchtime and i've got to get through it all who one you, o'clock who you playing st paul's yeah good. oh right yeah, yeah and good. david johnson's the center who had been at boys high the year before and made new zealand secondary school so mm. that was yeah baptism of fire straight off the bat mm. um and another guy chris patterson was their captain he was he he might have been hit boy at st paul's and he was like my childhood hero because he grew up in morrinsville and he's two years older than me Really good family friends, the and he would sort of he made all the rep teams and roller mills and and all that and Waikato under sixteens and whatnot. So, and he was their captain and he was playing halfback. So, I'd idolise this, this guy growing up. And you know, two years when you're sort of twelve and that, like when he's fourteen, you're like he's a man to you, and you're yeah. like oh. And then all of a sudden we're on the same field together, yeah. and that was, yeah, that was a pretty. And I remember we made a break and I got it. And I remember just gunning it for the corner and Chris was chasing me and he tackled me right in the corner, tackled me out. I didn't score. And I was like, I'm going to score on my debut for the first 15. And he was just like, there was no way I was going to let you score. <laughs> and he got it. He got me. But yeah, it was um, it was pretty cool. So so you develop, you know, fifth form, you're sort of making your mark. And then sixth form, you're becoming more of a major player. And then seventh form, you're the sort of the main man. And, and who's in that team? It's sort of Kurt Morath and Ella de Melmont. Yeah, and... well, Kurt wasn't actually there in the in our last year because he left school. But Kurt was there in, in, so in our sixth form year. Um, but, yeah, so we, in that, that sort of fifth form where... Like the, I suppose the names that stood out was Wellesley, being mm. head boy and captain, and then there was a guy Andrew White Tiki mm. who came up from Tataru and and Duncan Gunderson. Oh yeah, yeah, he was like Christian Cullen, eh? Wow, yeah. oh, I thought he was going to be an all that. He was the man. He was fast. He, he was so, he was so fast, fast, but he yeah. was like made of plastic. He was yeah. <laughs> always injured. Um, and then yeah, and then sort of that year twelve year, we kind of Wellesley stayed. So, That's right, second year seven. Yeah, he did a second year seven, but he was never at school. Was he was for, just was driving it, a courier van. Was it for rowing he stayed? No, nah, he stayed for rugby right. because he wanted to make New Zealand schools. And he'd sort of, he'd, I think he might have been Northern Regions and that the year before and and stuff. So he stayed stayed back to give that a good crack. Um, but that was kind of a rebuild year, 12. Mm. Like, Nate Roberts was there. Mm. Ah, he was the man. Yeah. <laughs> I was just talking to Nate not long ago, just on social media, on Instagram. And... Um, yeah, he's yeah. He was like he was my heart away. He was so good. Um, I actually played with his cousin like, later on, Jackson Willison. Yeah, yeah. So that's Nate, and he's reminded me a lot of Nate. Like they're very similar, very similar players too. Yeah, and sort of Nate Roberts was there. Stephen Wallace, who was another Morons of Boy playing halfback. Um, but yeah, it was kind of like it was sort of Wowsy, Wowsy Nate and Stephen was sort of there and the, they were probably a little bit more into the girls you know Stephen and Nate were they were probably then the rugby at that Dominate, time they dominated the girls though, yeah they, they, they did, did, did a really good job yeah, good, look, good looking guy and Steve old mouse Mousy, wasn't yeah, yeah. fussy either yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so they um, yeah but we kind of had a bit of a rebuild year that year um, not that we really built anything but then in my sim form year so my 
sort of year group, we had like this unbelievable under fourteen team. So mm. we I, we scored over a thousand points for during the season. Might have been twelve hundred and something. And we only had three points scored against us, and that was in the final against St. Paul's. So we dominated. We go into under fifteens. We do the same same again. So we get put up into a different grade. So we're playing like second fifteens and some first fifteens. Um, we make the front page of the Herald for a punch up as well down mm. the track. Then Tambrano was that the Travis Church? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. It was yeah, okay. that was crazy. Yeah, yeah. was it? Big, big all in brawl and yeah. So we we played Tamarnui. Yeah, does Dad punch someone? Or yeah, it started on the sideline. So it was <sighs> um, a guy actually Steve Kidd who played for Hamilton Maris. Yeah, yeah. And he's a Waikato Simmons coach now. Yeah, Steve was playing for Tamarnui. It might have been first. It might have been their first fifteen or um, yeah. Oh, and it was it was a good game. Like it was it was tight, and we hadn't really been tested much. We would just won all the time and. You know, it was tight, and then something sort of happened, and Travis was, he was always a little bit hot-headed, and, you know, that was Travis, and that, and he was good at that age, he was a good yeah. rugby player, but for that reason, because he was, he was, never took a backward step, and then we end up, bloody, yeah, this brawl kicks off, and there's a few patch members in that there at this game, and it just proper kicks off, and we're running to our cars, ref calls the game, we're running to our cars, grabbing our bags, and we're, like, hightailing it out of town, and a guy, um, Pete Nielsen, from he was from Morinsville, another fast, yeah. fast fella. Yeah, good looking yeah. kid as well. Yeah, yeah. So he he got knocked out. So we had to. He was in our carpool. So Mum had taken us to rugby this Saturday. Dad wasn't there, and we had to go up to the hospital there because he's no good to get his head checked and everything. And they make us hide Mum's car around the back of the hospital in case these you know guys come looking for us because they're apparently driving around town. And we had, they gave us clothes and that because we only had our school stuff like tracksuit and that. So they get, I remember them giving us like clothes to put on so that we didn't while we we're in the hospital we didn't look like yeah. we we're affiliated to to the school. Um, but yeah, so we had this really good team like that year, and then we sort of we went to the national under fifteen tournament and should have won that. We blew the semi final. Like breaks my heart. Still to this day, I remember against Otago boys, and then Otago going um, win the final by 30, 40 points. But we were, yeah, we should have easily beaten them, and we just we didn't play that well. But we still had the game, and we just made a brain fart basically in the last play and gifted it to them. Can, can we have a little Alad de Melmange interlude? Because I think yeah. from that group, he was the only yep. one that went on to become an All Black. Yeah, yeah. And I remember Alad, he's a friend of the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's someone that we hope to get on in the mm-hmm. future. Um, he was kind of went from an anonymous guy in fifth and sixth form, and then it seemed like that, <laughs> that break between sixth form and seventh form, he came back as the Incredible Hulk. Yeah. He just absolutely exploded. And um, we had a story on the Herald a few weeks ago about bench press records oh. <laughs> and he was number two strong man in the history of rugby or something yeah, he said yeah, 220 yeah. kg bench I got press some real good Alan as a 21 year old yeah um but do, is that what you remember that yeah, between so, six and seven for me just yes. turned into an absolute monster so me and Alan well like, we have quite a good like quite a big background so we went to morals of primary together so his dad was a rural bank manager he moved to town i oh, would maybe when we were about sort of nine or ten and i remember him turned up and he's just muscle head abs and muscles and was like what and we're like nine-year-olds <laughs> wins all that because i used to win athletics day he turns up wins, and then i lose and i'm like i've never lost before yeah. pretty sure i tried to bribe him my lunch money <laughs> to let me win the final still because i'm like i'm gonna lose and then he didn't let me so um he might tell you that story maybe if you get him on yeah. um yeah, and then we played, we actually played Gwynshield together and Roland Mills, and he was sick. Um, I played second five, and he played centre. Really? Yeah, so we're in the midfield together. And then we went to. We went some on, kid called Kahu, he turned up. And he yeah, yeah, and then up. we went, nah, he's involved too. So we go to Roland Mills, and we have Brendan Leonard at halfback, and Richard, young Richard Kahui. Well, we were all young, but yeah, so <laughs> Brendan Leonard, Richard Kahui, myself, Ella de Malmonch, Mark Berman, like all guys that played Super Rugby. All, we all played sort of that Roland Mills and sort of primary school age together. Yeah, and then we came to Boys High. I think Alad in his first year, maybe, he didn't he didn't grow. Like, he was big. Mm. Then he didn't grow. Then he did grow. But he he went to play halfback. 
because he was small, he's like, oh, I'll play halfback, but he couldn't pass. So I think he played like under 14 Ds or something yeah. as a halfback, and then he got a bit bigger, and I'm pretty sure he played, I'm pretty sure he played A's for us in under 15s. If he didn't, he would have been close. And then, yeah, then we sort of first 15, he came in the first 15 as a hooker in year 12, and then year 13, all of a sudden I was like, whoa. He, yeah, he did. He just got big. But they've got an even better story. So we leave school, we go into the academy. And then where he gets injured pretty early in like preseason, does an ankle or something, when we're playing touch or something like that. And the trainer, this guy Johnny Gillett, who used to be the Chiefs trainer when John Mitchell was the coach, he was our academy trainer. He goes to Allard like, all right, I don't want to see you for a month because we're doing all these early morning trainings and this and that. And Alan was busy with studying and stuff. He goes, I don't want to see you for a month. I don't want you doing any running. Gives him this protein, type of protein. He goes, get massive. <laughs> so Alan's like, okay. And then, so we don't really see, we're all doing our trainings and whatnot. And Alan's sort of there and not really there. And because he's, you know, just being flexible with the studying because he can't do the running stuff. And Johnny G's told him, go get massive. So I, I don't know the exact figure, but he comes back four weeks later and I'm pretty sure he's about 92 kilos when we left, which was pretty, pretty light for a hooker, but he's just ripped. Like mm. he's just all muscle mm. at six pack and everything. Then he comes back still with the six pack, still ripped at like 106. <laughs> so in his four weeks, he has just gone away and he has done exactly, which is what Johnny G told him, is get massive. And then he just, yeah, got bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger. Bigger. And then 2007, so that year before we seen you, we both made the New Zealand Maldives, um together for the first time. And that year was our first year of Super Rugby also. And Alad was... Like he kept losing feeling in his hands and they couldn't work out why and pins and needles. It was because he had like this he had compartment syndrome yeah. where his muscles would grow too big for his um, nerve system too oh, quickly. Yeah, yeah. So they stopped him doing weights. This is like, well, I don't know, around three or four of super. So he doesn't do weights for about three months. We go on this Maldives tour and then we're like, oh, all the guys are like, oh, we want to see Alan Finch. Like, you know, they're all whispering and they're like, is it true, is he? Like, I was like, yeah, but he hasn't been doing weights like three or four months. And we go to this gym session and he's, you know, he's a quiet guy, he's really quiet. And then um, he's like, oh, Swings, can you spot me? I was like, yeah, are you going to do some weights? He's like, yeah, yeah, I've been hanging out for this for like three months. So we go over to the bench and he, um, I, was, I was doing it with him and, you know, it was more of a workout for me putting all his weights on than it was <laughs> yeah. doing my own and then um he jumps on and like the one thing about Alad, like when he benches it doesn't matter what the weight is it, he seems to move it at the same speed so even if it's like if it's 140 kilos or you know what 220 kilos that he can get up to it used to move at the same speed so he gets on his 140 and i'm like oh shit it's pretty strong <laughs> Then he goes to 160 and it moves and I'm thinking, oh yeah, he'll just grind this out and it moves at the same, like fast. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then he puts 180 on it and then all the guys are looking over and they're like, oh my God, is he going to finish that? And then I said to him, I was like, Mega, you better not, we just call him Mega. I was like, Meg, you better not fail at this because I will not be able to get it off you. He goes, nah, I'll be sweet, bro. Jumps on, boom, boom, does three of them. And then he's like, oh, we'll put 200 on. So he chucks 200 on. By this stage, the whole team's there watching like, oh, we get to see it in the flesh. And he just busts out like three reps of 200 kilos after like three months of no weights. What amazing, amazing. <laughs> yeah. Have to get him on. How, how close did you, what were you like on the, on the Oh, I'm you, terrible. You like I would, no, nah, no. Nah. So I've always been consistently in the bottom three when it comes to <laughs> really? like weights. Yeah, yeah, like bench press, strong legs. Like, yeah. but didn't do a lot because, like, I'm sort of naturally a, like bigger guy, and if I lift too much weights, so I just get too big. Yeah. Like, put too much weight on. But nah, haven't never had good upper body strength though. Like, just never have. Yeah, like really? sort of like the best I've ever benched uh, 130 mm. for like one or two and that's like months and months and months of training it too it's crazy i guess it's yeah. a different kind of strength because when i think of you as a player i just think yeah. you're incredibly strong like such a powerful thing you know your yeah, upper yeah. body strength yeah, is yeah. Like well, that's what i'm strength. known for which yeah. is and it and it's 
like it, so many it's funny you say that because so many guys I've played with too over the years in different teams or guys that hadn't had a like long history with me and then they come into a team and we go do weights and they're and they're like, oh, is that all you're going to do? And it's like, well, I can do. And they're like, what do you mean? Yeah, but you're so strong on the field. But it, yeah, just, I know, I suppose, it's more functional strength, yeah. um, I guess. Like, I do use a lot of other people's force against them rather than using force on them, if that makes sense, yep. Yep. with fending in that. A lot of what I do is pushing myself away rather than using them to accelerate rather than trying to push them over yeah there is cases that you know we you, you try to but um most of the time i'm trying to use their force to get myself away okay. um, yeah before we leave boys high do you go back at all now um i haven't for a while like um i did quite a bit um uh, and to be fair like i i did heaps when i first left so when yeah. nigel hotham first took over I sort of basically, I was at nearly every training, um, sort of helped. I could, you know, I could, you would, you would probably both the same, like cared so much about the school and the yeah. opportunities it, it gave you and which, you know, I was so grateful for what the school had given me. Were you a boarder? I did. I did two and a half years because I was getting into too much trouble. Yeah. Well, and basically it was wagging and not going to school and not doing well in school. And yeah. it was basically leave school and get a job. Or I gave my dad the ultimatum was like, oh, we'll send me to boarding school then. And then, yeah, that was like quite a big turning point. Like yeah. focused me right in, mm-hmm. got really focused on sport then because it was there yeah. and it was something to do after school. So spent a bit more time training yeah, and right. got a lot fitter and, and things like that. But yeah, so I did quite a lot um, the sort of first couple of years. And then I suppose got busy, but then also got to a point where I don't necessarily agree too much with the amount that they do like i know they're successful in what they do but i look at the other end and what comes out of it and there's not a lot you know um there's something that gets floated around now the factory so they talk about the factory like having the boys size the factory but the original fact this that's a, a stolen name i'll say that because that's christchurch boys they, they've always been the factory like they were the factory before i was at school and when i was at school because they produce all blacks that was the reason yeah. and it's like well we hamilton boys wins like we're a successful school team but we're not producing yeah. the numbers of all blacks that you see come out of like a christchurch boys uh, i suppose which is and for whatever reason that is like that's very successful in, in what they do but yeah i just feel i don't necessarily agree with the amount of time that they spend so i'm sort of like kind of limit my involvement there mm. Yeah. You've had almost a 20-year career as a professional <laughs> rugby player. In seventh form, you made your debut for Waikato. Did you think at the time, like, how certain were you that you were going to be a professional rugby player? Was it the only thing in your mind? Were you just that driven, and did you think it was a sure thing at that point? Oh, nah, definitely not. So I remember, like, sort of around that sort of time, like, I knew I was, I was kind of, like, pretty good, like... But yeah, it was it was a massive shock when I got asked to play for Waikato as a school kid. Like there was, you know, I couldn't, I still struggle to can't comprehend think of it. Like any other school kid, it's happened. Yeah, it's, so it has so, that. Yeah, I don't. There was a guy, Jason Goldsmith, oh, who good. was he actually became an All Black. Yeah, good the, the, the same year um, that he debuted for Waikato, I'm pretty sure, yeah. and he was a school kid. Um, Todd Miller maybe was a... yeah I don't know yeah I don't know if Toddy was at school but Toddy was actually my roommate oh yeah yeah so he's my first roommate oh at, at, down at Napier yeah down at Napier oh, wow. and like, I chewed his ear off because I was like this like Todd Miller was like my hero like one of my heroes like, I love Todd Miller as a player and you know dad was a big fan of him too so that was probably no doubt why I was so you know and, and you yeah, you know, was so inspired by him and just, yeah, I just thought Toddy was the man and, yeah, he was my roommate and he's so happy that he gets to go away, you know, get a nice peaceful night away from his kids <laughs> and they rest up for the game and he's got this kid in his room. Yeah. It's just like asking him all these questions. Um, so what's that like? He, is it a phone call from Ian Foster to tell you in the squad or is it yeah, the manager? So, or? Nah, so that's, that's like quite a cool story. So I was sitting 
in Mr. Hamilton's maths class um, and I get a note in class and then I'm sitting there looking out the window, probably not doing much work, not focusing. <laughs> Mr. Hamilton's like, Dwayne, and I look, because the runner comes to class, and yeah. then he's like, Dwayne, and I look up, and he's like, you got to go to the principal's office? And I'm like, oh, no. So I'm like, oh, okay. So I pack, pack my bag up, put my piece of refill probably back in my bag, and my one piece I had for the day. <laughs> and then I'm walking to, you know, to the to the front office there at Boys High, and the whole way, I'm just trying to think of... What have I done? What have I done and excuses to get out of it. And I'm just like, I know that I didn't go to English. And that was because I was kicking the other day. But that's all right because we got this game. And I can just say, oh, you know, I was really focused. and <laughs> we just wanted, yeah, yeah, just got all these like things. Trying to think of all the classes I've missed in the last sort of week or, or whatever I've done. And um, I remember walking and Barb's is sitting and she's yeah. got this massive grin. And she's like oh you're here to see miss hassel and i'm like oh yeah and she's like okay sit down there she's like, this big smile like, that's weird like and i was this like, is barbara for those that don't yeah, know yeah. this is barbara clark who's yeah. a school ledge yeah <laughs> still there yeah, now yeah yeah still there now uh, still the first 15 manager yeah. um yeah and so she was the first 15 manager at the time and i sit down and i'm sitting there and I'm waiting for quite a while like i don't can't remember how long but it felt like forever and you know, I'm all sweaty and nervous and, um, yeah, so I walk in and then Miss Hazel's like, I'll come and sit down. And then she's like, oh, starts talking to me about my day and whatnot. And I'm like, okay, where's this leading to? And then she hands me a piece of paper and she goes, oh, you got to ring this number. So I'm like, oh, so I ring the number and then, oh, so I asked, I was like, because we're not meant to have cell phones at school, I almost got to pull my phone out of my bag, <laughs> and then I was like, oh, can I use the phone? She's like, yeah, you can use the phone, so I borrow a phone. No, I said, please, obviously. Nice. Yeah, please, miss. <laughs> 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 and then, um, so I ring, and then it's like, hello, Ian Foster speaking, is the, the, was the current Waikato coach, and not long, not that long finished playing, like, yeah. and I'm like, I'm like, oh, hi, um, I, I got told to ring this number. And he's like, oh, is this you, Dwayne? And I'm like, oh, yep. And then, uh, oh, no, I said, oh, hello, it's Dwayne Sweeney speaking, like, because Dad always taught me to answer the phone like that because he's a livestock agent. So people always ring in the house and then they think I'm trying to sell their bloody cows. Um, so I'm like, oh, hi, it's Dwayne Sweeney speaking. And he's like, oh. And he goes, oh, it's Ian Foster, the coach of Waikato. Do, do you know who I am? And I'm like, y y yes, yeah, yeah, I know who you are. And he's like, all right. And he goes, um, oh, are you very busy this afternoon? And I was like, oh, what sort of time? And he's like, oh, well, he goes, can you be at um, Waikato Stadium at 2 o'clock this afternoon? Um, and I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Hang on. So I asked Miss Hassel, I was like, oh, Miss Hassel, can I... <laughs> <laughs> can I go to the stadium at two o'clock? And the little did I know, these two have already spoken. <laughs> so he they already been filled in. So she's like, Yes, that's yep, that's fine. I was like, oh, okay. And she's like this big grin. And then I'm like, Oh, yep, that's fine. He goes, Oh, cool. Uh, have you got your boots with you? I was like, Nah, they're at home. And he's like, Oh he goes, Oh, I need you to go get them. And he goes, You get um and then can you ask Miss Hassel if you can have the rest of the week off? as well and I'm like oh can I have the rest of the week off school too and, and then she's like yeah that's fine and I was like yeah she said that's fine he goes oh it's cool he goes all right I'll see you at train this afternoon and you're going to make your debut for Waikato on Friday oh, first Hawks Bay and I'm just like like <laughs> go, I didn't know what to do so I remember like walking out of the office and I'm walking to my car because I'm like oh, I've got to go back to Morinsville to get my boots and um, so I'm out of the hostel at this stage because halfway through sim form I, I moved back home once I got my license and was travelling back and forth. And then so here yeah, I'm driving home to get my boots and get home and mum gives me an earful. She's like, what are you doing home? You need to be at school. And <laughs> Relax, so I mum. tell her, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've got some news for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, so I was, then I was off to training. And I remember walking in and sitting in, it was changing room three because they reserved changing, changing room one for, for game day. Um, and for the official squad, so we're sitting in change room three, and I'm there early to like. Obviously, the coaches wanted to talk to me, and so I met them, and I like, oh, yeah, just in the change room, wait and get ready for training. And I'm sitting down, and Regan King walks in the door. He becomes an All Black that mm -hmm. year. No, no one knew who Regan King was then either. He was, um, he 
just come on real fast mm. and he walks in sits down he's like hey bro Greeks and I was like hey um, Sweens and we have a bit of a chat he's like who do you play for I was like oh Hamilton boys <laughs> and he's like oh you play for old boys I haven't seen you do you play Colts or something and I was like oh nah Hamilton boys hi and he's like hey he's still at school and I'm like yeah and he's like ah oh, that's mean and I was like oh okay and then a similar conversation with a few of the others and yeah, go who, out to who's training. The, who's the highest profile player in Waikato at that stage in 2002? Who's the, Who, when they walk into the dressing room, are you going, fuck? Yeah, well, there was like a few, like, because that's sort of the era of like Roger Randall, um, uh, Bruce Rayhana, uh, Lockie Crichton just come to Waikato, Keith Robinson just signed with Waikato, Stephen Bates just signed. So those guys probably weren't so known, but then there was like John O'Gibbs, Marty Holler. Um, was Keith Lowen in that group? Keith Lowen was there. Uh, David Hill, Reese Duggan, Isaac Boss, Dion Muir was the captain. Uh, yeah, there's a big name. And they're all there because Super Rugby's finished. So it's like, this is the squad that's getting ready for NPC yeah. then. And Rog and Bruce Rayhana were at the Commonwealth Games playing Sevens in Manchester. So there was two spots there that they weren't there and then Kev Lyon had like a niggle and he didn't play so that was my sort of spot in yeah team of men it's obviously a big men you're walking in there as yeah. a schoolboy obviously you were a big schoolboy yeah but, but you're still a schoolboy yeah and so fast forward to the game against Hawks Bay and you're starting like how much of it is nerves how much of it is scared like is there are you actually shitting yourself in just yeah the, in terms of the physical battle you're about to go into with these men as a schoolboy yeah well i was like i didn't i didn't start i was on the bench but um yeah i remember i was there and then isaac boss come to me and goes oh have you got the lollies i'm like what and he's like youngest player on the bench has to provide the lollies for the reserves so i'm like you're shitting me. We don't eat lollies before you play rugby. Like, this, this, you know, I'm just rookie. No idea. I thought he's stitching me up. He's like, nah, bro, you better get lollies. If you don't have lollies, like, fuck, you'll be in the shit. And I'm like, oh, okay. So, I'd, oh, here I am, like, game day, and I'm, like, rushing around. I'm trying to find, like, a bloody, like, somewhere to buy some lollies. <laughs> the party mix. <laughs> yeah, I did. So, so, I go and buy this party mix, and then I'm there, and I'm, like, getting ready, and we put the sideline jackets on in the shed, and I'm, like, nervous like so nervous because i'm like I was you're always, 17 right i was 17 yeah so i was like quite an anxious sort of person as well like when it, you know i used to get nervous like mm. quite you know not not real bad but i used to definitely get nerves um and still still do um but i was like you know i was really i just remember being so nervous and having these lollies and thinking like fuck i can't let the coaches see these so i'm trying to like sneak them into my pocket of my jacket and then trying to like make sure they're not sticking out so like no one could see them or whatnot like oh yeah but we get out there and i was sitting on the bench and then um one of the guys was like who's who's got the lollies and then bossy looked at me He's like, you better have the fucking lollies. <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah. I got them, so I pulled them out. And then I'm like, like you know, I think it's the, like I'm passing bloody illegal drugs down the, <laughs> down the scene. I'm like, oh, yeah. And then I just like into them. So I'm like, all of a sudden, oh, okay, this is normal. Like, yeah, this isn't a stitch up. But I remember I was like sitting there and the game was sort of going. And we actually started, we, we started to dominate. But there was a massive physical battle like in the midfield and Regan King was having a blinder. Like he's not a big man, he's quite slight, tall, mm, mm. but just... I remember, him, I remember him from the outback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he would have done well in there. Yeah. <laughs> he did do well in there. But he was just really silky and I remember there was just this massive like battle in the midfield and I'm thinking like, oh, that's where I trained all week. So I was like, you know, quite getting quite nervous. I'm like, shit, if I have to go out there like this. But then they end up putting me on the wing because Regs was playing well. And, uh, Derek Macy might have been playing second five, I think. And, um, yeah, so they, they kind of left those two there and then took one of the wingers off. But I remember it was about 25 minutes to go or something, and then they're like, oh, um, Sween's warm-up, you're going on? And I'm like... Was I was kind of thinking that oh, I might get like a minute at the end or something, yeah, but yeah, sure enough, like 25 minutes. And I just remember being out there and just everything happened so fast, like I just couldn't get over how quick it was. Like, 
you know, like I suppose just the, the level of skill gone up, the guys are bigger, they're faster and just everything happened really, really quickly. And before I knew it, the game was done and I was like, oh, where did that go? Yeah, but it was, um, it was pretty nerve wracking time. And that was your only experience that season, right? Yeah. So yeah, that season. So what happened is because they, the official squad was named, I got pulled in and played, but then I was in the frame for New Zealand secondary schools. So right. What they did was had an agreement with Miss Hassel at school that I could go like a few days a week and train with the team full time. So I was kind of like in a professional environment getting ready for they they might have known more than what I knew that mm. I was going to be involved in New Zealand schools maybe. Um, yeah, so to, to prepare me for that campaign. So that was a really good learning curve and got to be involved and that team made the final that year and a loss to Auckland yeah yeah in 2002 so that was um that was a pretty pretty awesome team to be involved with there was some wicked men like yeah like Dion Muir was a real captain like mm. he was the man <laughs> yeah so it was pretty cool to sort yeah. of be involved with that group especially because I had quite an extended period with them um like it was a couple of months and then I actually got a phone call it was a day that Waikato beat Canterbury at home, and it was like a mat. It was fifty nine forty or something. It's a real big high scoring game, but I got a phone call that morning because a heap of the guys had got sick, and they're like, "You need to get here." So I got there and warmed up with the team, but didn't need to play. And then um, I was kind of happy, kind of happy, but not to play that game because like Scott Robinson was playing eight, and Justin Marshall was at nine, and. Andrew Murdens was playing 10 mm. and Aaron Major at 12. Like that was, the, you know, that was when the All Blacks all played mm. it, and it was the All Blacks. Yes, yeah, so that was, was Do, do cool. you reflect like when you're 17, 18 and you're talking about Dion Muir as being the man? Yeah. And do you think like now <laughs> as a 35, 36 year old, there are young guys coming through and they're seeing you in that same light? And do you feel like, yeah, do, do you have a frame of reference for the eyes that they're seeing you through now oh yeah i yeah i I don't know if they'll see me like i saw dion because i don't i don't know what people or how people see me or whether i i I definitely wouldn't put myself in that class just i don't know with um just my own sort of feeling i guess like i I wouldn't say i'm a dion muir of waikato rugby like that's sort of insulting him in, in my mind this is real interesting because I was thinking about this yesterday when I was going through the notes and I actually, like I know what you're saying. Yeah. But I think I disagree with that because you like when you actually look at what you've done, it's pretty incredible. Mm. Particularly like in the modern sense of the game, like yeah. you made, you, you played a hundred, you brought your hundredth cap up for Waikato last year. The first player to do that since Reese Duggan, I think in 2003. So that sort of shit just doesn't yeah. happen anymore. Yeah. I suppose. I don't it's know. It's long, probably it's the longevity. Yeah. It's tough to obviously. It's the sort of the Kiwi thing, isn't it? If we were in America, you'd be bigging yourself up. Yeah. But it's very hard to <laughs> yeah. say good things about yourself. But I think yeah. we can say good things. Yeah, and I, yeah. Like, I just I remember thinking last night. I was like, "Fuck, this is going to be quite buzzy actually to sit down with someone who's kind of like a legend of New Zealand rugby." Um, and th- this isn't meant in a disrespectful yeah. way. But, like you weren't an All Black, no, nah, no. Nah. But in terms of like your con- contribution to the game locally here, yeah. it's pretty significant. Yeah, because yeah. there's only 22 people that have done that before. Muir's yeah. not on that list. Yeah, Muir is. Is yeah, he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So exactly. Muir was just before he. So they that 2002 year they had to make the semi finals for him to hit 100. Yeah, and then he so, left. Yeah, so he he hit the hundred in the semi, and then the final was one hundred and one. Yeah, yeah, and then he left. He was, and then but he had signed to go to Japan before that season started. So when we were, when I was playing my debut, we already all knew that it was public knowledge that that was his last season. So. Yeah. I want to just yeah. uh, jump around a little bit now, mm. Sweens. Um, I, I want to touch on your seven, your time with the sevens in two thousand and six. <laughs> yeah. Um, we've already spoken about your speed, your two hundred meter <laughs> your specialist. <laughs> yeah. But obviously, in a sevens environment, is full of absolute pace mm. merchants. Mm. When you're doing the training and the tests and the speed work, where are you in that pack? Are you um, at the back or are you holding your own? Oh, uh, I was. I was pretty good fitness wise. That like when, so. Um, I mentioned Ski earlier, Waseki Masarewa, um, who was our coach that 
assistant coach to Stivey that took over. He was our sevens coach from Morinsville, and he I played with him when I started at Morinsville. He was still playing Prem Rugby. And he was actually, that was, I played in the year that Titch released his book, and he named his all-star seven of all time, and Ski was in it. Nice. So I was kind of groomed by Ski. Like, I loved the game of sevens. Like, I grew up watching Hong Kong sevens, you know, as a kid, and I loved it. I was just fascinated by it. I loved Christian Cullen and, you know, Jonah and Eric Rush and Glenn Osborne, like all those guys playing Dallas Seymour. Scott Pierce. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> he's yeah. so proud of that. Like, yeah, his face. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I know seven. Yeah, see, there's, there's rugby players that wouldn't know. Yeah, that. that's awesome. Just, I love yeah. it. Um, but you know, like I, I was just really, I don't know, just from a young age, just fascinated, just taken by the game, and I just really wanted to be good at it to play it. So I was really lucky that Ski was involved. You know, one of Titch's all time seven was at Morrinsville. So I basically just tested him for every thing I could sort of learn from it. So I went as a what would I I must just when I finished school I went to the um, sevens nationals and I hadn't really played apart from Condor Sevens or for yeah, Boys High. Yeah, for Boys High and it and, and we didn't have you know, we didn't train. We just like train for a week and then play. Yeah. It's, we just pick the seven fastest guys pretty much in the <laughs> in the team and you go and play. And then um so I, then I trained with Waikato over summer and then we went and I went to nationals and what they used to do back then was pick a squad of 50 out of the nationals um, tournament and then you'd go to camp and they'd have, yeah, it must have been five teams of 10 and then you'd fitness test and it was just hell, hell. Like, talk, talk us through a Titchens oh, training session. Yeah, like... So, yeah, those camps, like, you turn up, you'd have testing. So you do a beat test first, and then um, this fo- uh, speed testing. Then, yeah, so you do speed testing, and then the phosphate decrement test. Have you ever heard of that? No. So it's 40-meter sprint every 30 seconds, So and you do 10 of them, and they measure your drop-off, and then, oh, obviously, is your, right. like, okay. repeated speed, I guess. So yeah. they speed test you first, so they get your max speed, so that when you do the phosphate decrement, you've got to be, like, max effort. Because if you're too far out of, you know, your first rep, they're like, well, you're taking it easy. You're not yeah. pushing yourself because okay. we can see what your max speed is. So you've got to be yeah, pretty close to it. And then they, like it gets to the point where guys are literally walking like they are that fucked. Yeah. Because it's like 10 maximal effort, 40 meter sprints. Like, and you're going, so you do it in, yeah, I don't know, like the fast, fast guys, they're like speed tests. Like a Sassini Nisi would do like a four seven five for forty meters and you know, then he he might his slowest one, like he was pretty fit, so his last one might be a five one or a five two or something. But then, you know, someone like me, I was sort of just under five, I think, when I was sort of playing sevens. But that first year I went, I was like just sub five, like a four nine five or something. But then like my slowest one was like six one like right. i just yeah right blew out or well, maybe more six two or something i was just because i just was not conditioned for it and yeah. it was a massive shock and i couldn't perform in the games like i did at nationals because the training load was so hard but obviously that's the level you needed to be to perform so right. the kind of the cream rises so when he's picking his squad it's like well the guys that are performing they might you know like you know straight out fit fresh might not be as good but he knows he can rely on them yeah, you know, yeah. in the back end of a tournament they'll deliver at that level and he i suppose there's probably exceptions to the rule where he'll put someone in the squad that's not there but he knows he can get them there or, or what, whatever it may be was the bronco but, test on it wasn't the, around, around then no nah, so i didn't do a bronco until <laughs> like have you done one recently have you 2017 seen? or something put in a reference with bodie barrett's for 12 oh, or something i just yeah. wondered if, if that's yeah. crazy yeah. yeah i've seen a sub four with this middle distance right he actually went to boys high um he was helping us out uh with oh just with like an assistant sort of trainer role where he's a middle distance runner sort of like 1500 sort of thing and he did a sub four minute Jeez. bronco yeah he's quick he's proper quick yeah okay. real quick yeah yeah what's that seven circuit like um 
Yeah, so it's it's funny because it, like, I was thinking about this today too because I listened to you guys' podcast with Anton and he was talking about the travel side of it and how he's like, oh, you know, the rugby players go to these places and that players and they go, you know, and they get locked up in a hotel because it's not safe to go out. It's very similar for rugby. Not the fact that you can't go out. It's just literally like, and it'd be the same for cricket. Like, it's a big toll on your body. So you don't actually have time. And you, like everyone was like, I remember, I remember thinking going into it, I was like, oh, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to see the world and this and that. I saw hotel rooms and training yeah, fields, know, you know, know and that. a stadium. Yeah. That was it. Like you get one day off a week and that day you, especially when you're playing sevens, you do not want to go anywhere because you're like, i got to do it again tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> then i got to be ready to go on Saturday and Sunday. So you're sort of, yeah, you're very, it's not, it's not all just travel and yeah. And that it's you know it actually is quite draining the yeah. travel factor like it's so much nicer being at home and getting that little bit of time to yourself and yeah just sleeping in your own bed and having right. your own meals. But when you're playing at like Hong Kong or Wellington, oh, do, atmosphere. Yeah. Do you do you feed off that or do you yeah. not know that? Nah, it's you know that's there. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like I'm real big like atmosphere is atmosphere to me. Like I don't care. If it's that final in 2009 against the Bulls or if it was my debut at Wellington Sevens where everybody's going for you or everyone's going against you, atmosphere is atmosphere mm-hmm. because it's just energy. And it's it's funny now with like COVID with yeah. what's going to happen with Super Rugby with no crowds. Like you get so, you feed so much off that. Yeah, and interesting. Yeah, just the, you know, you can feel it. Like you when you're at a game, it's so much better than it is when you watch it on TV. Like... Apart from the fact that if you're watching on TV, you can be more social, but if you're at the game and it's, you know, you're right there, you're living it, you're in it. So, yeah, that's that's the cool part. Like, that was, I was so glad I played Wellington when it was in its prime, and I played it before I went to it, which was the cool thing. So I never experienced it as a fan before, I, until after, like years later, mm-hmm. I went back um, as a fan. So I... I'd seen it on TV and, you know, seen the tickets sell out in bloody 30 seconds or whatever it used to do. Yeah. Yeah, and and, and being there as a player was just like, this is awesome. And as a, like, 20-year-old or 21 or whatever I was. Best time. shape of your life. Yeah, 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 I was pretty skinny then. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's funny, though, eh? Like, I wasn't, like, I wasn't, I was... You were never skinny. Were no, you? I was you never were... skinny. Like, <laughs> actually, never was. Like, because we get like skin fold tested, and yeah. it's like, I don't know whether coaches like have this like illusion. Like, just because I was skinnier then, like my skin folds have never really changed. Like, it's just been, they've just sort of stayed the same. Like, pretty much my whole career, I've definitely got bigger, but it's not. I haven't got like necessarily heaps fatter. Maybe a little bit here and there, but it's not. It's been pretty consistent, sort of fat wise. Everything's just got bigger. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, yeah, it's weird, man. Yeah. Can I but, ask? Can I ask one more sevens question before yeah. we run away? Is it? And that's missing out on the Commonwealth Games in two thousand and six. Yeah, that was quite hard. Yeah, yeah. well, you were one of, I think, the seventeen contracted players. Mm. That's a, but that's a hard story. That one. Yeah, and yeah. then five. I think five. One from each franchise mm. was nominated. I think four of those five yep. ended up going. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was a real hard one. So. They, what they did was they named the squad with those five guys in it. So Doug Hallett being one of them, Tommy Allison, Josh Blackie, Josh Blackie, Ken Sos, Sassini and Isi, yeah, and Tanner Latimer. Yep, the, this guy, eh? there we Kill go, it. killing yeah. it in the seventh round. Nailed it. Yeah. Really, um, really likes it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so those, those guys, they named the squad with them in it. So all of a sudden you got a squad of twelve. Yeah, there's like half of it gone. Yeah. Um, Cause I think only only Howlett didn't go. Yeah, only yeah he did his hamstring. Yeah, maybe the first day of training camp. Right. I can't remember, or maybe before. I can't can't remember, but it was pretty early on. And then they named a um, they named two non-traveling reserves, which was myself and Orlando Solkai. Oh. Um. So, but what happened is because the Chiefs lost Sauce, I wasn't in that squad. I'd been and Kahui had gone. To, he was in the wider training squad, so I was playing sevens. Kahui's playing. He's in the Chiefs' wider training squad. He got taken. So how it worked is 
if you're on a wider training squad anywhere, anywhere back then, anywhere in the country, if another team got an injury, they can take you. So basically, you're there training, ready to go, and if the Blues got an injury, you're up the road. If um, the Highlanders got an injury, in Kahu's case, he's in, and he's down there, and he's at the Highlanders. So his spot goes there, so then they're like, oh, well, because you can do sevens and... Training squad. Training squad, yeah. So what they do is they pay you an extra, uh, at the time, might have been $5,000, and then when you're home, instead of training on your own, because we used to just meet a week before we would go to tournaments, a little three weeks bit. So you do a week training camp, which was basically a trial out of the squad of 17 for the final 12 to tour. Yeah. And then you go on a two week tour. So two tournaments yeah. and then come home. Then you'd have this period where you would have a training program, but you'd do it yourself where now it's all centralized. Now, now. Yeah. Now it's all centralized. So they're all together, which is a lot better and easier to, you know, it's a lot easier than training on your own, trying to do those sessions. And then, so what I was doing was coming back to Super Rugby and I'd lost all this weight to play seven. So I'm in this like battle because mm-hmm. Titch wants me under 90 kgs, which I hadn't been since I was probably <laughs> year nine. Yeah. And then <laughs> the Chiefs want me at like 97. So, which was about, at that time, was about roughly what I played at. Yeah. I was sitting at about 94. 95 yeah. because and but Titch still wants another five off mm. it, you know like and it got to the point where our physio for New Zealand Sevens at the time Kevin McCoy who's now the Chiefs physio he was like this is this is going to ruin you like so we used to go and weigh in each morning and he just started changing that so I just my weight slowly came down but didn't <laughs> but he was what just like guy. and he's like Titch is like oh yeah <laughs> This is awesome. Like, you know, he's losing this weight. I'm going back to the Chiefs and they're trying to put weight on me, so I'm doing more weights. And they're like, and I actually played club rugby in between. Yeah. And I'd lost everything I had that was good about my game in the game of 15s. Because I thought, oh, yeah, sevens, I'll be so fit. I'll just run around all day. But I didn't gain any speed. I actually, if anything, I kind of lost a bit of speed, but I could just run all day mm-hmm. at this like pace. But it was like, I couldn't break tackles anymore. Mm. I was never going to get skinny enough to be super, super fast that people couldn't catch me. I needed the power. And yeah, right. I, and, I, and at the weight that I was, I still had power in sevens because everyone was little and, mm. you know, I was still bigger um, than sort of most and, and still had that power. But when I transferred back to 15s, it wasn't there. And it was I was playing club rugby and I was, like, embarrassed. I was like, this is shit. I can't even make breaks. And I'm playing sevens for New Zealand sort of thing I was struggling well you know not struggling but not being as dominant as I would have liked against like Mata Mata and <laughs> things like that so um, I was in this battle between the two and then so what happened that week was Sauce going there they're like Chiefs and Titch are fighting over me he's like I want him here because he's a non-travelling reserve and we need um, we need to have two here and they're like okay so I've if he's if the test squads fit him well, what I think it was only two training days, then he'll go, like you know, then he won't be going to the Commonwealth Games. But we, they, it seems Sam Tui Tupo, that was the year that Sam Tui Tupo played for the Chiefs. He was injured, and they're like, oh well, if Sam doesn't come through, then Sweens will play for us this weekend. Which I was shitting myself. I was like, fuck, I'm not ready for that. But so I had, so they had this battle, and they're like, okay, we'll agree. So the Chiefs agreed to release me on Wednesday, so I had to train Monday, Tuesday, and then I could go over. But what had happened? What was happening over there is that Monday was testing day, Tuesday was basically games day, and then the final squad was named on Tuesday night. So oh. I just needed people to get injured to have a chance. So what happened is Doug Haller gets injured. I'm the only back that's a non-traveling reserve, but I wasn't at camp, so Titch took soaks, so he took an extra forward over a back which which makes sense yeah. like you know and I'm not really I was gutted that I didn't get a chance to go to the Commonwealth Games because it would have been a fucking awesome experience but it was just not meant to be at the time like timing was just off and yeah it was it was shit it was hard to miss out but you know I was I knew I kind of knew at that stage that sevens wasn't my long term mm. I'd, I'd scratch that itch. I'd wanted so for so long to play, but it was so draining and 
and it was really really hard um touch was a extremely hard task master so it was very draining and so you just did the one seven circuit yeah so and that was yeah done. so then come back for waikato uh, and then we make we end up winning the Air new zealand cup that year and then i make super oak b but so what happened is after the final we were meant to go to camp for new zealand sevens and because i'm still contracted you're obliged to be there they're like uh, unless you make a super rugby squad then it's basically your choice kind of if the super rugby team wants you to go then you still got to go but otherwise it's your choice so touch rings me you know good luck for the final or whatnot he goes oh you and because Corey jane was in the squad as well at the time he was playing for wellington i was playing for waikato and he goes oh you guys don't have to be here till Wednesday. So we're playing Saturday night. And they're like, he's like, a, you know, you can just come to camp on Wednesday. But Super Rugby squads were named on Tuesday. So that was basically like, if you don't make Super, then you'll be coming. And then Super Team gets named. And then Tits rings me that night. And we're like, I'm a few beers deep by this stage. Because we had won. So we've kind of been celebrating that <laughs> right through. And then we get hit again with this awesome news. And there was a heap of us, like Brendan Leonard... Allard, um, mm. Kahui, Toby Lynn, myself, we'd all come through from like 13 year olds, all playing Waikato age group together and we win the New Zealand Cup and we're in that squad and then now we're all playing Super Rugby so we're all, you know, on this awesome journey and ride together and celebrating it and then he rings me and he's like, oh, I still want you to come to Dubai and to South Africa. So basically, like the kind of the balls in my court, I ring fuzzy and i can't i kind of i knew they didn't want me to go so i was like sweet this is gonna be all good like he's just gonna say nah you're not going so i bring him and then he's like oh yeah no that yeah if you want to go that'd be awesome and i'm like fuck i don't really want to go so then i'm like what do i do and then i was like talking to the boys and they're like bro just ring fuzzy and just tell him you you don't want to do it you've had a big year and you just want the break and then just tell fuzzy to tell him no and then i was just like oh okay so I rang Fozzy and Fozzy did it for me. So that was all right. <laughs> I got out of it. Can we go back to that 2006? Because that's in the days where crowds are flocking to oh, provincial rugby. How good is a night out in Hamilton after you've won <laughs> the uh, the Air New Zealand Cup? I think it was. All. Yeah. So we, I remember tickets went on sale for that final. Must have been Monday morning. And we had a meeting that morning and I remember them coming in and I was like, we like joke, joke, I joke about it now with the younger guys. I was like, you just have no idea what yeah. Provincial Rover used to be like. It was like Justin Bieber concert. Like, <laughs> it sold out. And like, yeah. Yeah, there was people that stayed the night by the gate. Like, hundred, I remember coming into training because we train out of the stadium and I remember coming into training and there's like, around the gate one there, there's people lined up in the morning with like 7.30 and I was just like hundreds and hundreds of people yeah. all there to get tickets and that sold out in like an hour or an hour and a half or something big deal 25,000 eh? people yeah. and there's so many people that I've come across in life that were like I was at that game Yeah, I remember that and and then nights out in the town you're wearing your yeah. blazer oh yeah and there's, there's no lines just, a, yeah. just, yeah. just straight to the front that's a little chick magnet yeah. yeah. in the back <laughs> one of the rugby boys yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. so we, I always felt awkward with that though I used to hate it I'd always jump in line just just out of like respect because no one likes that dickhead that walks straight to the front yeah. Even if, even though they're gonna let you in, it's I still used to stand in line and I'd wait there, and if they waved me forward, then I'd go. But if I was with friends and they wouldn't let my friends with me, yeah. then I, if they weren't like Norman Stewie, mm. if they weren't, if they said no, nah, then I'd jump back in line with them because I was just, like, when you're in that sort of rugby circle, it's so easy for people to have shots at you, oh, yeah. so you just don't want to give them any ammo, it's just like, oh look at this dick walking to the front, like that sort of thing so it's just like, yeah, yeah. There's there's a, a lot of ground I still want to cover, but I, I just want to sort of briefly touch on a few things, um, yeah. so 2005, you're in the under 21 uh, All Blacks team, World Championship, played in Argentina, and some names in there Richard Kahui, Ben Franks and Kieran Reed. Uh, according yeah. to my notes, it suggests Kieran Reed wasn't actually a starter at that age group. No. What, what do you... I mean, he's obviously... We all know what Kieran Reed has turned into. Yeah. Um, incredible player. Why was he a slow starter? Why was he not... 
was well, it? he was that year he was a year young as well so that that probably didn't help in his favor that he was a year younger so he was he would have been 19 turning 20 with the rest of us are sort of 20 turning 21 yeah. which you know at that sort of level is quite rare that's a big difference it, uh, like it's yeah. actually quite rare to get in at that age uh, too right. like right. there was but that year there was a lot so richard kahu is one so even though we're the same year at school he's young for his year um so he was he he went the following year also um there was uh, Willie Reapier, um, Maya Nikura, Andy Ellis was in that team, um, Tani Alamoa, the reserve halfback, he was a year young too, um, got Serge Lilo. Liam Messon was in there? Yep, Liam Messon was in there, Jose Gear was in there, um, yeah, so there was like oh, Isaac Ross. Jeremy Thrush, like, you know, a lot of All Blacks came. But I remember the team the year before was just like... They won it, eh? Yeah, they, they, they won it a couple of years before. Yeah. Um, maybe quite a few in a row sort of thing. And then I remember all of us looking at that team the year before and just being like, wow, you know, like their back line was like Pity Whippu, Stephen Donald, Luke McAllister, um, Jose Gear played in that team, Ben Artinger. Glenn Horton, like, you know, these guys are all, but they were all, I remember, because I trialed that year too. So I trialed three years for New Zealand Colts. So I went down as like a 18, 20, 19 year old. And then like went again the next year and was sort of like a non-traveling reserve um, for that team. So I was sort of on standby, but then finally made it third time lucky. So got in there. But I remember like that year, like guys like Luke McAllister, Ben Artinger, Glenn Horton, these guys, they were all playing Super Rugby. So I remember going to trials and they didn't even trial. Like they're there because they just like, either Dan Carter was still eligible and so was um, Dan Carter and Martin Nonu, but they made the World Cup. Uh, it must have been the year before, sorry. So Dan Carter and Martin yeah, Nonu, true, yeah. but they made the World Cup squad to go to the Rugby World Cup in 2003 in australia so guys like that were like floating around at these camps and i remember all of a sudden it's our year so and i suppose our turn but none of us were like and we we're just looking going oh our team sucks <laughs> compared to last year <laughs> yeah, are, yeah. You th- are you genuinely thinking that is it- oh yeah shit yeah we we're like talking about it but then you look at what happened like you know like because you know you don't know what's going to happen, but Kieran Reid, like hundred test All Black, like All Black captain, got New Zealand Order of Merit yesterday. Yeah, mm. um, yeah. Richard Kahu, he plays multiple games to All Blacks. Um, Jose Gear, you know Liam Messam, like all these guys. Andy Ellis, like mm. we were t- all of a sudden, you know Isaac Ross, Jeremy Thrush, Ben Franks, like all these guys, and we, I was just like, we. So, yeah. So you look at it now. Yeah. And when you you're, go far, that team was mean. Yeah, yeah, but when you're back then, are you thinking, we're going to be All Blacks one day? Oh, nah. Yeah, nah, I didn't. Yeah. Like, and to be fair, probably, like, there wouldn't have been, like, there's probably only Liam, really. He was a beast at school, like. Yeah, there was probably... Superstar. Sort of Liam and Jose, where you kind of looked at them and were like, yeah, they're going to be All Blacks. Hmm. But they were the last two out of that group to, you know, so I named all those guys that became All Blacks. Hmm they were the probably the last two to make it sort of thing like Liam was sort of there or thereabouts for so long before he actually got in mm. where I think Andy Ellis was the first one he went and played Super Rugby the next year and went really well and then all of a sudden he was an all black mm. and um yeah so it was yeah it was a pretty pretty good team the, the the next place I want to go is if you if you go on YouTube and you search Dwayne Sweeney um one of the first vids that well there's a lot of fishing vids that we'll get into in a bit but um <laughs> there's a uh, one of the most powerful videos is of the haka that the Waikato gave you after your oh, yeah. 100th game. Yeah. And you have a really sort of emotional interview afterwards and you're kind of overcome. And I just wondered, when you're experiencing that and you've played 100 games, which is probably beyond your dreams and expectations when you're sort of a young 6th, 7th former, um, and reflecting on your career, are you thinking that that it was all that you wanted it to be like did you achieve all of your goals and dreams by by reaching that milestone um yeah i suppose like i i remember it was kind of a big talking point when i came back and you know like i it was kind of a carrot they dangled at me before i went overseas to try and get me to stay 
so it's big mention like this is back in 2000 I, I signed to go to Japan in 2011 sort of tail end of 2010 into 2011 and I remember having meetings with um, Gary Dawson was the CEO at the time and and, and Stormy and Gibbo and things like that and the Chiefs coaches also but I was like you like they dangled that carrot they're like you're going to be the last Waikato Centurion and that's in 2010 so fast forward 10 years and you know like like oh yeah I was I kind of in a way like at that time I actually took it in offence because I was like, you think that all I'm going to be is a super rugby player and a Waikato player. They couldn't see me going because the only way I wouldn't have got there if I'd stayed is if I'd become an All Black. So at the time, I was kind of like, well, what? Don't you think I can be an All Black? Like, So I was like looking at it from a different point of view because I, I wanted growth. I wanted to keep improving and to be better and, you know, it's... Uh, and the next step for me at that time was to become an All Black. I'd done everything but that. Mm. But I was just... I, I knew that wasn't going to happen. So I was I was, I was, was at peace with my decision to go overseas. Mm. But then when I come back in 2017 and then all was, that was my driving force. I was like, okay, 78 games. Um, what It must have been 32 at the time. I was like, yep, I've got it in me. I've got you know, a good two years and then, you know, I'll get into that third year and away we go. And the first year I play fucking four games <laughs> and fucking rip my adductor off my pelvis and I'm like, oh no, like, here we go again. Then the next year, I actually played sevens again, which was crazy to think. So I played for Waikato sevens when we won in 2018, won the national title. And so that was cool to do that because I'd never been in an and a team that had won a national title, even though we'd had good teams, we'd, we'd never won it. And at 33, going on 34, to play, or oh, it might have been 34, even going on 30, no, it must have been 33, going on 34, to be able to play sevens 12 years later. So it'd been 12 years since I played sevens in my last sevens national, so that was cool. And then, yeah, so then it was. And then I ripped my hamstring off the bone playing club rugby for Morinsville in a freak accident. This guy gets it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm about that. Yeah. yeah. So, like, just a freak accident. Like, I am super fit because I played seven. So, I'm like, yeah, I'm ready to go. Like, this is going to be a good year. John is coming back to be the head coach. So, that's exciting. What's that like playing for playing oh. for a guy that you – he captained you, right? Yeah, yeah. So, all three of the coaches that year. So, Rog – Right, um, yeah, so Jono, head coach, he was my captain. Whitey was my captain, Nathan White. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, for quite a big period. We played pretty much. We debuted together. So I'm cap number 1,006. He's 1,007. Um, and then, yeah, Rog as well. I played with Rog for a number of years. So that was that was kind of cool. Is that, was, an is that an interesting dynamic? Is oh, uh, there's a lot. It, it's, I found it really good because there's a lot of mutual respect. In terms of like, when they ask you to do something, I'm like, oh yeah, I can do that because I've seen you do it. Yeah. So there's that, it's that way and it's probably the other way too because they're like, oh, I've been there with him. I know what he's like in that moment. So I can respect him for what he can do, yeah. Um, which, yeah, and I think it worked really well. It's, it's interesting sort of dynamic because I probably spent more time with the coaches that year than I did sort of in the play, uh, player group. It was quite a good... Yeah, yeah. So, uh, a question about yeah. that. Do you find it hard? I mean, you're obviously at such a different stage of life than a lot of players now when you're sharing a dressing room. You know, you've got two kids, you've got a mortgage, you've got a wife, you've got a, a life going on. Yeah. A lot of them don't have much, you know, no, 20 yeah. year olds. Do you find it hard to relate to the younger players or do you slide back into that sort of team camaraderie locker room chat? Yeah. Like, I think of. I kind of blend into most sort of environments quite well and I think it's kind of like a lot to do with probably my upbringing like Moranzal is quite a diverse little town and you know there's like all sorts of you know I guess people and and different sort of backgrounds that and then I went to Hamboys and you both know what that school's like you know all walks of life it's such a big school and you kind of you know so I guess I kind of sort of fit into most situations quite well and but sometimes I and I suppose being 
kept in the last couple of years as well. That's a different dynamic again because then I got it. It was actually Jono that told me he's like, you got to remember that you're going to have to ask these guys to do things sometimes. So you've got to be careful in the way you act around them. Like you can't just be one of the boys all the time because when you need to put your foot down it's got to mean something so you've kind of got to separate yourself a little bit so that was really good learning for me because I've always just been always tried to be just one of the boys like just try and fit in with whoever and do whatever and which is you know that and when you ask someone to do something you have to have a big element of that because there has to be that respect for them to to follow the direction that you want to take the team I guess do you get asked to go and join the nights out with the boys yeah and if yeah, you yeah. do join are you kind of like the novelty they yeah just, they, just, yeah. they just absolutely Sweet. love Sweet. Yeah. 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 yeah pretty much yeah. yeah so it was hard case so we like my 100th game <laughs> uh, we all um went around to it was matt lansdowne's flat and um we all go around there and uh yeah it's sort of like it happened like to be fair i've i've re- kind of made a conscious effort to to keep that a pretty constant and you know like and i'm very lucky like marie my wife she's been awesome in that respect like she understands that the i suppose the pres- the pressures of professional sport because she's been there for the ride for you know such a long time like we got together in 2010 and she came overseas with me and everything so she's seen a lot she's been involved in the rugby environment for for you know 10 years so she understands that there needs to be times where the boys can just be boys yeah. and have a beer and de-stress and, and rant and bitch and moan or whatever it may be just to get it out. And then we click the fingers, roll on Monday and we're focused again because if you don't, it sort of balls up and then explodes and then someone does something stupid or yeah. someone provokes something and, and whatever it may be. Just on that, speaking to some of your former teammates, it seems you've always kept your nose pretty clean in terms of off-field incidents and, um, you know, getting... We've seen a lot of rugby players can get themselves into into, into trouble. Mm. I We have been made aware, though, of a little incident... Not an incident. Yeah. <laughs> doing the mile with a, uh, a dredge gun for Laporte. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That's so so like for those listeners the greatest that, day. that don't know what the mile <laughs> the is mile or is the was... the greatest day. Um, what is it? Yeah. So the mile, this like highlight, probably off-field highlight of my rugby career is the mile. And it like breaks my heart that they don't let us do it anymore. Um, so what it is, like we started, it started in 2005, I'm pretty sure was the first year and we just decided as an end of year thing we'll do a pub crawl so we meet at Billy Mulligan's on the main street so the, the main old, street the old Billy but yeah. it's before it got burnt oh. down oh yeah is that what got burnt down there yeah oh. well, some say it was Canada Girls upstairs but oh. I think it was Biddy's went Biddy's went up in smoke as well yeah, yeah. Last either way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so the well Victoria Street's a mile long so that's why it's called the, the mile um, you start at Biddy Mulligan's and how it worked out is um yeah i can't remember who initiated it but whoever they are they are the man um, <laughs> but so we you pair up so you try and pair there's a lot of um thought and and that gone into it it's not just to piss up and go and get loose like it, there's a lot of strategy i guess so we try and generally pair up a bigger drinker with someone that's not so much so yeah. you kind of look after each other and that's your partner for the night and um how it worked is you see, you go there, you get partners. Uh, you start at Billy Mulligan. So as you head south down Victoria Street, left hand side of the road is left hand, right hand side is right hand. These are good rules for, for our Christmas. Yeah, party. yeah. So it's easy, you know. So it's whatever side of the road you're on. Yeah. Um, the drench gun was punishment. So obviously, if you get caught with the wrong hand, wrong side of the road, you get to squirt out of the drench gun, the the port. <laughs> Um, Port is such an interesting choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was all sorts winning that over the years, but Port was a pretty constant. Um, didn't tend to last too long, and then you'd have to fill up along the way. But um, so yeah, as it works, so hey, you, we worked it out. So your pairs, and then you go round for round. So as you go down the street, so if it, you know it's me and you, Seamus, then the first bar I'm by, and then we go across the road. That's your side, and just go back and forth. And how it works is big drinker, light drinker, as you help your mates out along the way. So it's like if you're a big drinker and then 
your mate's struggling, yeah. you know, you might do half his beer for him or whatever it may be. And then away you go. And um, so how it works is you have a tour leader and there's strategy to that too. So you wear a yellow jersey. So tour leader, he's the pace setter in that bar. So it's like, all right, Seamus, you're tour leader for this pub. You, they, you've got the yellow jersey. So you go in, You um, once you're finished, you put your handle back on the bar, you walk outside, you blow the whistle, everyone's got a minute to get out. And you can't Jesus, you can't cool. blow the whistle until everyone's got a beer. So you gotta wait till everyone's got their handle yeah. and then you know, you buff it and then you go outside, <laughs> whistle and then you know, if you wanna take your time, take your time. So there's strategy to it because when the boys get a bit rowdy and it's getting out of control, yeah. you go give it to one of the lesser drinkers and you say, Oh, take your time, like just relax. We have food stops along the way as well and what it how it used to work is remember Kremlins? So that was a Jeez. Yeah, it was the yeah. vodka bar, yeah, the, the Russian one. Yeah. yeah, so that would be so once you know, and the the funny thing was because we start at like four o'clock, so mm. we're rolling down. You know, it's like a Wednesday in Hamilton. A, I think we've got a new invitee for the uh, Christmas party this year, Steve. By the way, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then we'd roll down. So we're hitting like, you know, the the restaurant area of town. Yeah, dinner time. People and we are yeah. hammered, and we're all well. The first year. Just a few of us got dressed up, so I, I don't know why. Kahui decided that me and him would go as these cowboys, so we went to the op shop, and I don't know how I got in those jeans, but they were tight. Mm. Like we, yeah, those it was, thighs, it was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Brokeback Mountain was probably a thing around then. <laughs> and then uh, or if it wasn't, then we inspired something. And then, um, yeah, so a few of us sort of got dressed up, and then it became a thing. So each year would set a theme. And like one year was what you wanted to be when you grew when you were five. What do you want to be when you grow up? So I went as a stock agent because that's what dad was, and all sorts of things. <laughs> Other years it was sports themes. So you come as sports person. And, and Mega actually had a real Ella Demel which had a wicked one that year. He made a he came as American football player, and he made like a he cut a volleyball. So it's the old school helmet, <laughs> you know? Like yeah, uh, it was really really good though. It looked awesome. But yeah, he did that real well. Um, yeah, but it was it's yeah, it was awesome. And you just pick your way off down the Where's the ending? Outback. Ah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah, the only place to finish. Yeah. Yeah, those gets quite sloppy. We we do a um between two beers pub crawl every year. Well, since we've been going. Um we've done about three in a row yeah. before it was between two beers, but yeah. It it seems to get a little bit skittish around sort of pub sort of yeah. eight nine ten easy tiger's the one that does us in every year oh yeah because we've, you, we've you get, switched from a, you have cocktails there yeah i introduced a, a spiced rum oh, um, nice. old-fashioned and then yeah. a few double down pubs and then by yeah. by 12 it's sort of i think we were doing body shots <laughs> off nice. each other on the bar it wasn't a good scene yeah, yeah. yeah there's some video <laughs> you guys are fitting well on the mark <laughs> yeah. yeah well yeah. we'll yeah. bring it back so you you've you've won a in 2006 you won I think it's the the New Zealand Cup, yep. ITM Cup, whatever it might be. How does that compare to winning a Ranfurly Shield in two thousand and seven? Because um, oh, you've done it twice. Yep, you kept yep. you kept in one as well. Yeah, two twenty eighteen. Yeah, so um, I, they're kind of different, eh? Because it's like the Ranfurly Shield's got so much sort of history, and the I suppose the the like in New Zealand Cup is. That's a like, like that's a long term thing. Like that that takes a lot of consistent effort. But that Ramfilly Shield is like you can turn up on the day and change your life forever. So it's a very different feeling. Like you can't just turn up and win the New Zealand Cup. Like that takes months and months of hard work and, and whatever it may be. And it and takes obviously it takes hard work to turn up and win the Ramfilly Shield too. But there's something about that log of wood that just brings the best out. So mm. you never know what's going to happen on that day. Like we saw, you saw it last year with Thames Valley playing Otago. Like Thames Valley are in that game, and they're a bunch of amateurs, farm boys, and builders, and whatever they do over there. Like you know, and they they almost end up with taking the Ramfilly Shield into second division. So it's very very different in a way but like yeah you just mentioned the Ramfilly Shield and your blood starts you know as a rugby player your blood starts to boil you're just like oh, 
Let's flip you don't it get then. many chances to yeah. to have a crack at it. So I think, like I I remember talking to the boys before we played Tanaki, and when we won it in 2018, and I'd played. Maybe at the time, I might have played about 80, well, maybe close to 90 games. It must have been about 87 games for Waikato, something like that. And I'd only challenged for the Ramfilly Shield in 2005 against Canterbury. Again in 2007 of North Harbour when we won it. And I don't know if I'd... Oh, and then Canterbury in 2017. So at 87 games, I'd only had three cracks at it. So when mm. you got these young guys in the room thinking, oh, yeah, ran for the shield, like, oh, this is cool, thinking it's going to come around, like, you know, oh, each year or two will get a shot. It's like 87 games and I've had three cracks. And, yeah, it's when you put it in perspective like that, then it's like, whoa. Mm. Then to flip it, mm. what's it like to lose it? Horrible. Like, it's actually really, like, having it is really draining so I talked to Dion Muir about it after so we defended we won it so we had a we had our longest ever losing streak in Waikato history and then like 10 games I think it was from tail end 2017 into 18 mm. then we got thump Wellington on a it was a hard case so John, Johnny gives us our pre-game speech we're playing one of those midnight uh, midweek games sorry like Wednesday night and he's like boys I'd love to tell you there's a big crowd there but there ain't <laughs> your parents your family's probably not even going to be there it's a shit cold night in Hamilton and it's a Wednesday they've got work tomorrow and then we go out and we we give Wellington a hiding but that was that had kind of been brewing like I knew this that team at that moment I knew we were good then we kind of originally we had like a c team we had guys playing in that tanaki game because we were fish we were kind of thinking like tanaki really strong team they're not in the championship they're in the premiership our whole end goal was to make it back to premiership like we were really disappointed that we're in the championship and it was all about putting mana back into the jersey and and everything that was all that we were focused on was getting back to the premiership so we were targeting games etc you know, trying to be smart. We come through Wellington, but we come through really well. So four days later, so we, yeah, we had four day turnaround to play that game. But then we had Hawks Bay another four days after. So we had three games in eight days. We hadn't won for like a season and a half, pretty much. Like we had 10 games and then we go and thump Wellington. And then it's like, oh, all of a sudden I go into the coach's office and the, day, the next day for recovery they call me in and I look at this list on the board and I was like is that a development team and they're like no nah, that's the team that is going to play the Naki and I was like why the fuck is my name not there and they're like do you want to play I was like fucking hell I want to play and they're like oh well we were thinking we were going to target um, make sure we beat Hawks Bay because they're in the championship like we need to win that one and I was like oh okay I understand that so when I did my recovery whatever come back and they're like do you want to play and I was like, yes, I want to play. And they're like, okay. So they rub it out, rub the whole team off the board. There's guys up there that hadn't even trained with us. Like then they, they were going to start against <laughs> buddy. That um, they're going to start against Tanaki in a ran for the shield game. And then they starts writing the team out, writes the exact same team sheet as what played Wellington. I was like, yeah. So we go down there, and yeah, we like blow them off the park. And it was like I've. I talk about, you know, that Morinsel game being my greatest, you know, sort of game of all time, but for like, because of what happened, the lead and everything like that, but in terms of like a one off like game of, a uh, game of footy from like whistle to whistle, there was like, no one would have beaten us that day. We were on fire. So that was pretty special. And then we have to go and turn around and defend it four days later. And we're getting all this shit sent to us on social media, like Rugby Pass are putting up these posts online saying, Waikato, shortest rain in Ranfilly Shield oh, history, because wow. we got four days. So if we lose, yeah. it's the shortest rain ever. And when we had the Shield, 
I don't know, whoever runs that rugby pass page, they must, they know their shit. Because they were like, you were in the team last time. Because when we lost, when we won at no seven, we lost it six days later. So we were the shortest tenure at that time, like equal with Wellington or something, whatever it was, who did it way back in the day. So they knew their shit. So they sent it to me privately. And they're like, oh, and then I'm like, fuck this, there's no way we're fucking losing. And then Brad Webber's on the bloody... Um, so he was captain last time I could have won it. And then he's on the radio and TV all week saying how he owes Hawks Bay one because he took the shield off Hawks Bay when he was playing for Waikato and he's coming up the road to get it. And yeah, we went out and thumped them. Um, it was a pretty tight game, but we kind of just, we were just grinding it out. And then, yeah, they they even said after the game, they're like, you would have thought, they, they had like an eight day rest before that game so they were like licking their lips like these guys are going to be tired we're going to get them and we actually came at the back end of that game we might have scored 25 points in the last 20 minutes or something mm. we blew them off the park and then we way and then you know then we played southland and then it was uh, Dion Mill was there for that one and it was awesome having him there because that was my 90th game and they were talking about you know the possibility of in the sheds after the game of me becoming a centurion and, and whatnot and because Dion was there he was captain on day one and then we had a few beers that night and I actually ended up staying at Roger Randall's house <laughs> and got on the piss with Roger Randall and Dion Muir that was pretty cool slept on the couch with Dion Muir I was like oh this is <laughs> this is pretty wicked and um he was just talking about it and he's like I remember we were just sitting there, we are having a beer, and we are listening to LAB, and it's like quarter to four in the morning or something, and he just looks across the table, and he's like, it's draining, eh, bro? And I was like, eh? And he's like, having the shields, draining, eh? And I was like, it is a bit. And he's like, everywhere you go, everyone's like, don't lose that shield this week. And it is, like, when you got it, like, when you go to play for it, like, it's fucking exciting, and it's all in. It's just that moment, that, that chance for that moment to like lift it up or whatever it um whatever it is and just to be that fairy tale story or whatever and it doesn't matter who you are like you got a chance you step on the field you got a chance to win southland were all over us for 15 20 minutes um before we uh, sort of woke up and and put it to them but a lot of that's that nervous anxiety and you're just like what if we lose it to southland so you kind of you get into this funny state of mind but it's we always spoke about you got to win it. You can't defend it. Mm. So I w- I spoke to the boys. I was like, when we we would uh, have our sort of captains meeting before captains run on a f- the day before a game, and I'm like, and I'd have the sh- I had the shield there for that, and I'll be like that. You know, it's ours now. Once this meeting's done, it's not. We're playing for it, and we you know it's, we don't have rights to it. Like it goes on that sideline, and whoever wins, it's theirs. So we've got to remember we're going out to win it. We're not going out to defend it. And it was just so like, you know, you go get petrol and they'd be like, oh, you got Southland this week. Don't lose the shield. And you're like, oh, you got the supermarket. Oh, don't lose the shield this week. And then the, you know, the the hard thing was is that we lost it to Otago, um, which it set us up well because we, you know, we're firing our belly, going into semis and the finals to really get them and we'd been on this hot run like we had been playing so well up into that game and we kind of it was a good reality check but it was a hard one like it was real hard to take the hardest thing was is that we played so badly mm. like it might not look bad like watching it we didn't make a lot of i guess phys, uh, like visual errors like it wasn't like some knock-ons or whatever but we missed so many opportunities that if you're in the know and you know how we prepared and like the first three tries that they scored, we'd seen every single play and we knew they were coming, but we missed them. And it was just like, we'd, I'd seen two of them unfold. I'm like, sweet, here we go. That's right. And I look, and then we've got four people coming around the corner who are meant to stay. And I'm like, Oh my God, how did you miss that? Mm-hmm. But it's just, you know, emotion or whatever it may be in the moment, the big game, the nerves, and we missed them. And then, yeah, so that was real hard to let that go because we let it go. They, they, they played well. They took their chances, but, yeah, we definitely, get you know, didn't... I could happily hand it over if we fronted and played really well and we just got beaten. Because you have to hand it over, don't you? Yeah, that's the hard bit, physically. Yeah. You've got to pick it up, shake his hand, give it to him, yeah. 
And I caught flack for that too. People wrote shit to me on social media on Instagram saying that I need to do that with more dignity and respect. And I was just like, I did it as I did a lot better than um, Croswell did when I took it off when we took it off Tanaki. But oh, whatever. When, when you had it, did anyone people say, just love having a dig? Yeah. Mm. When we when you had it that time, did anyone say don't take it back to hush hush? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was spoken about. So we got but where did we get back? we got back. And we were, um, nah, it must have been, oh, it was the Hawks Bay game, yeah, so, which happened to be Adam Burns, um, 50th too, which is another good boys high man, head boy, um, mm. yeah, he's, how old's Adam? He must be sort of mid-20s, yeah, he's not that old, like, yeah, he should be still, he definitely should be still playing, but, um, <laughs> for whatever reason, he's decided, uh, not to, but he... Yeah, we, I remember we went we went out that night to have a few beers and it was uh it was there like it was sitting on the table and we were getting pretty rowdy, and then we were going downtown and then Mike Crawford the manager's like oh you gonna take the shield I was like no nah, it might be best that you take that home just in case you know <laughs> we don't want anyone to have like sort of a dig at us for anything yeah. that we kind of did so yeah before we <laughs> before Stephen jumps onto his prize topic and we'll get there in Japan mm-hmm. talk us through playing against the Lions so you said you only mm. had three cracks at the Ranfilly Shield yeah. and not every rugby player in New Zealand gets a shot at the Lions so nah so that was a real like surreal moment like last time the Lions came was 2005 so it's 12 years when they come 2005 and back then was they used to play the provinces mm. so I don't know how, like, they played Bay of Plenty, they played Otago, they played Auckland and Wellington, I think. That yeah. was it. Yeah, I went to the Auckland game, actually. I remember that. Mm. But it was very, like, you know, not not every province got a shot, and Waikato didn't get a shot, so I was like, oh. Did they play in 93, or whenever they yeah, came? Yeah, yeah, they thumped them. Yeah. Why could I go to them? That was the glory days. Oh, There's real. Mulu magic. Am I like, surprising you with my... Yeah, look at you. Yeah. Rugby knowledge. Yeah. 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 I'm in my element. Yeah, yeah. so they were like... Um, yeah, they were like... So they... We didn't get a crack at them, but as it turned out, we were... I was away with the under-21 World Championship then as well. So we missed the big game in Hamilton, the Maldives mm-hmm. game. We missed that because we were still away. So it was a bit disappointing because I would love to have gone and watched that game as a... As a you know, as a supporter, as a fan, um, it was that was a pretty epic game, and I love watching the footage of it. Um, it actually was on over lockdown on Sky replayed it, so it was quite cool to watch that again. That rugby was a bit different then, mm-hmm. eh? Mm-hmm. Shit, it was rough. Like it was physical, man. Um, not quite as fast, but man, it was physical. And then it's yeah, it's funny thinking that. How do you think you would have gone back then? Well, I was playing then. I was playing oh, for yeah, Waikato true. then. Yeah. Like, that's the... Fuck, let yourself yeah. down then, yeah. eh? You're yeah, doing, yeah, yeah. You are doing so well. I was thinking... I was thinking, <laughs> I was thinking 93. I was yeah, thinking 93. Yeah, yeah not, not, Nah, I wouldn't have survived 93. Yeah, I would have been running running out of rucks anyway, that's for sure. Um, but yeah, so it was like... No, oh, you know, didn't get a chance at them. And it's like, oh, next time the Lions come, I'll be, 30, you know, 33. There's no way I'll still be playing then. Because then it was like... You, you played with 30, you're like the man, you know, you get to to that sort of age. And, and Japan, the, which, you know, we're going to get to, like that probably played a big part in that too, um, in terms of my body. But yeah, to come back and as it kind of worked out, I was kind of in a bit of a grey area. I went to the Brisbane 10s with the Chiefs and we won that in 2017. And I just sort of finished my contract in Japan. And I was sort of humming and hiring whether I looked to go to another club back over there or stay. But I remember when I found out that the club I was with wasn't going to keep me on, I rang Dad and I said, I'm going to become a centurion for Waikato. And um, that was kind of a driving factor. So I come back and I wanted to make that work. Um, they were still hesitant. It was Roger Randall was the one that got me signed. So they were still pretty hesitant on getting me back, whether they thought I wasn't going to be up to it or whatever it may be. Um, yeah, that was sort of it was quite hard sort of negotiation to get across the line, um, but then they made me captain, so <laughs> so it worked out all right. Um, but yeah, Roger really pushed hard for me for that, and Roger was actually the backs coach and attack coach for the New Zealand Provincial Barbarians, 
and which now that coaching staff is involved with the New Zealand Māori team. So they've they moved from there into the New Zealand Māori squad. So yeah, Rog was a big part of getting me back, and then I signed with Waikato which gave me a provincial contract, which made me eligible. So I literally signed and then two or three days later, I got the phone call that I was going to get to play against the Lions. And it was a big thing. They spoke about um, Super Rugby, like their lack of experience of us versus them. Yeah, you had half the David, caps. like Goliath. No, nah, it was more. So we had a total of like 80, I must have been, I was 80 odd. Super Rugby games, mm. and I had like 78 of them, or 70 of them, or something. It was crazy yeah. amount, yeah. So it was... But a lot of those guys had gone on to do pretty big things, like Lockie Beauchere, It was, you know, on fire for the Chiefs the last few years, and you know, in my mind should be an all-black, but yeah, he's got pretty tough competition with Artie and Sam. Mm. Sam sort of there, but yeah, there's... There was and Sever Reese was in that team and Bryn playing against his dad. So Bryn must have been about ten or eleven when we won in two thousand and six for Waikato, oh, yeah. and he used to be at training all the time and I'd be out there and I my claim to fame is I taught him how to goal kick because yeah. I just would be out there you know young keen after training or you know like me now the older boys would go back inside and stretch up relax but young keen you hang around and. Yeah. yeah, he'd be out there kicking a ball, and then yeah, now he's playing Super Rugby. So, and I got to play with him, which was pretty cool. Like that was a kind of probably the highlight of it. Like it was awesome to play the Lions, but to think that from that kid, mm. you know, it, mm. like he was a kid, like a proper kid, like ten or nine or whatever he was, and I just rem- I have this like vivid memories of you know kid, like playing kicks and passes and stuff with him and then all of a sudden we're playing against the best players in the world and his dad's coaching and his dad's coaching against us and then we fucking should have won (laughs) (laughs) yeah that was that was pretty amazing and yeah i suppose just we talked a lot about the longevity of my career and playing for so long and that opportunity came up and yeah i was stoked so 2012, you make the decision to go to Japan, and Shay gives me grief because he thinks I'm obsessed with asking people about how much they earn, <laughs> but he's the one who's put these quotes on this page, which I'm going to read, from a <laughs> Waikato Times article, I think it was. Yeah. It says, Sweeney reckons he was shocked by the size of the salary package when offered a playing contract by a Japanese club several weeks ago. I'm not going to lie, it just blew me clean off my feet pretty much, said Sweeney. I was like, geez, how many zeros on the end of that? Was the decision to go to Japan a purely a financial one? Set you up um, for life? Uh, it was, yeah, it was. So finance, financial, like, had played a big part in it. But, like, in terms of the playing career, so you know, we kind of mentioned it earlier, like, I haven't been in All Black. Um, 2010 was kind of like a crossroads for me. I needed, I'd done the same thing since 2002. So, like, nine seasons, I driven into that stadium sat in the same seat because we're creatures of habit it's what we do and trained on the train same field or oh, the training field changed a couple of times but yeah. trained in the same gym sat in the same seat and just done the same thing yeah. and it was like i needed a change and the little did i know that the chiefs were going to move and they were going to go and base themselves at Ruakura and have new coaching staff. and Win two yeah, titles in a row. Yeah, win two titles <laughs> in a row. You know, like, I didn't know, you know, I didn't yeah. know that. And and to be fair, if I knew that, I probably still would have gone. Yeah. Just not, not for the financial side of it, but I just needed something. I needed a change. I really wanted to experience overseas. And I wanted to go to Japan because it was closer. So I had a really good offer to go to Ulster with Jared Payne, another boys high boy, who played for the Lions. Um, yeah. I was really hoping he was going to play that first game because I wanted his jersey, but he didn't play. So I was gutted. I said to Gats, I was like, you should have played Jared in the first one and we could have swapped jerseys. But um, yeah, so we, yeah, I was going to go to Ulster, but I'm just a like homeboy and a family boy. I just wanted, didn't want to be that far away. And the Japan season, you know, you sort of, when I, the first sort of club I was at, you'd get sort of six to eight weeks off a year and it'd be summertime. So we'd come home, you know, normally sort of February through until like April-ish, around, you know, sort of April, May. 
and then it was just like so you get the beautiful weather of New Zealand in the off season and then you go and then it's only three hour time difference yeah. and it's one flight home so if anything happened and you had to get home it, you can do it yeah. it's you know you just jump on a plane fly through the night you're back here and then you know if you had to shoot home for an emergency or whatever it was so that was like that sort of made my decision to go there um a bit easier and the way i looked at it is like if i wanted to play high level rugby like because europe is high level rugby then japan i would have stayed in new zealand because we've got the best you know we've got super rugby we've got all the all blacks yeah. that we play against all the time so it's like the best rugby players in the world are here why would i go to the northern hemisphere to play on shit slow fields and play heaps of games and like and that level's quite hard and it's physically demanding but it's you know it's a lot longer season and i'd rather stay here make less money if, I, if the driving factor was high level rugby then it would have been here but the fact was that i just needed a change i wanted a different experience and yeah financially it was a really easy sort of decision to make to go to go to japan it was and a good good four years six six was it six yeah, years? yeah so i went 2011 no. like I played mm. Super that year, Super Rugby in 2011, and then left. So that was another good little, like, good timing for me to go. So a lot of people held off that year because they were like, oh, am I going to make the All Blacks? Like, no, you know, World Rugby mm. World Cup year, or am I going to push for that? Where I knew I wasn't in that frame, so I was like, I put myself on the market end of 2010. So I kind of got in six months before the market just got flooded yeah. with oh, yeah. all the, you know, the players that play the World Cup and then they're like, oh, I want to go to Japan now. Yeah. Or um, they miss out on the World Cup and, oh, I'm ready to go to Japan now. I got in like six months early. Yeah. So like 2000, like for me, like every kid wants to be an All Black, like in New Zealand. If you play rugby, it's even some kids that don't even play rugby probably want to be an All Black at some point. And that was always a driving factor and I wanted to improve and be better. And I kind of like through my whole career, like I never really stayed in one position. So that's hard. Um, and when you talk about a super rugby squad, that's a good thing because you have versatility, but with the all blacks, it don't matter versatility because you just pull someone else in. Mm. So, so you, you just got this team and you've got all these players here to pick from it's not like you've got this amount you know a small amount of players in terms of a super squad to pick your players from so being versatile helps that where in, in the all blacks if a center got injured it don't matter you just get the next best center rather than get this mm. utility that can play center yeah, yeah. but hasn't been playing there because he's been playing wing or fullback or whatever yeah. it may be so it was really good from a point of always being included in a super rugby squad and might attend cup squad but really hard to push to that next level because they can just replace a specialist with a specialist because there's you know a long list of them yeah yeah so that was that was kind of one i guess sort of downfall um the other factor was that we had martin Nonu and conrad smith probably the best well the best center pairing that world rugby's ever seen <laughs> yeah. and they played for a long time like right through my prime years and it's a tough nut to crack before yeah. my prime years and after like you know they were so good for so long and i'd you know they don't get talked about a lot because of carter and mccaw but those two for what they did for how long they did it like yeah they were they're the, they were the backbone of that back line for the all blacks that was so good for such a long period so that's really and you look at how well richard kahui played for big parts of his career and he got a few games here and there in the midfield and played mm. probably more on the wing Wind, because yeah. of those two. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I was kind of... But I always wanted to know. I just want to scratch that itch. Could I front? Like, if, just give me a moment. Give me one game just so I could go out there and see if I can play at that level. And then 2010 happened and the New Zealand Maldives get to play Ireland and England in a full test. So, Ireland... Um, you know, got Johnny Sexton and uh, Brian O'Driscoll and that. And I was gutted because I was meant to mark Brian O'Driscoll and all. He was like another childhood hero. And I was just like, yes, I get to swap jerseys with him. 
and he got he pulled out just before the game he got injured in the warm-up so yeah. i missed that moment which was pretty disappointing like it would have been awesome but it was still an awesome experience and then um yeah england had just been an aussie in aussie for the first time ever maybe mm. or in like a very long time if it wasn't the first time ever and then we come down and then we beat them and i got man in the match in one of the games so it sort of gave me all of a sudden i was like okay i'm good enough i'm just not good enough here mm. which i was comfy with i was like okay sweet if if the all blacks needed me see at that moment they guys got injured and i had to play i could play and i was happy with that i was like okay, i'm good enough i'm just not better than conrad smith yeah. or martin or, or you know <laughs> yeah, these, yeah, these are big you know some of the best midfielders yeah 100 the test all blacks you know like yeah. which you, i'm happy with like mm. gutted but it's just you know timing and yeah yeah. Your career's been too dense, Swains. We've been talking for two and a half hours, and I yeah. feel like we're only just scratching the surface. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's so much there. Um, but before we, we do wrap up, though, there are a few things I want to touch on. At what stage do you start thinking about life after rugby? I know you're still playing, and I know you're doing some coach development work. Mm. Was it a few years ago you start to think, well, what's next? Is it a, is it a career in rugby after I've finished playing, or has, it always, has that always been the case that you're going to stay in the game? Yeah, well, I think, like, probably the fact that I've stayed in it so long as a player shows how much it means to me and how much of a driving, well, you know, gets me out of bed in the morning, really. So <clears throat> it's kind of a changing landscape now, I guess, with what sort of happened with, I guess, professional sport, with what's going on, it's all up in the air and whatever it may be and it's it's real hard because i've done this since i was 17 so mm. i literally hadn't had i haven't had any time to do anything else like if you want to stay in the game at a professional level like you know like you've been involved with high level soccer and you know how hard it is and how hard you have to work to be at that level and be involved like you can't it's really like people are like, I should be doing stuff outside of rugby and this and that, but it's like, well, how can you stay in the game? If you're constantly trying to look at getting out, you're going to end up out, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah. So it's like, just, I've kind of, I, I've i always sort of, I guess, had sort of interests or thought of things outside, but all rugby's done is just grow a whole lot of skills, skill sets for me, really. But the hard thing is, is that there's nothing on a piece of paper mm. when you finish, you know, like you go to university, you got a degree. Okay. So if you go to university, you graduate, you got a degree. I've got this amazing list of life skills that I've achieved from rugby, but no one's to know it because it's not this, on a piece of paper. Now you've got this podcast, you, got podcast. Though, you can just skip this, <laughs> you just skip this yeah. to people. So yeah, yeah. Listen to this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's like, you know, all these leadership skills and, um, I guess, you know, but in terms of like man management and working with people and talking to sponsors and fronting media yeah. and public speaking, like there's all these things that people pay huge money to do, but we get to do it. We get to learn it. Um, yeah. Like through, through the game, but there's nothing at the end of it. It's yeah. just literally you stop playing, you stop playing. And it's yeah. like, there's great support network in terms of the players association and stuff for transitioning out i haven't really sort of dabbled into that yet in terms of 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 what they sort of do i guess i've kind of i've kind of always thought of i kind of cross that path when i go to it just try and grow relationships const constantly throughout in terms of people that i'm interested in what they're doing and and you know just sort of show an interest that you know that maybe when i finish that might be something i look at getting into in terms of like you know i've been working a little bit with like a sportswear company that's in terms of like sales and mm -hmm. and that sort of thing so just because yeah. i just want to i've been around people constantly you know like rugby's very sociable and and a lot of personable interaction with like face-to-face -face sort of stuff that when i do finish playing i want to do something like that so you've got to be that or it has to be outdoors because mm -hmm. Yeah, otherwise it would be probably too much of a shot. Like, I'd happily go get on the end of a hammer yeah. because it's just, you know, it's physical. I'm still using my hands, doing something, but, 
you know that's probably but the hard thing is is i'd have to go back to being an apprentice yeah, because i haven't yeah. had time to yeah, yeah. qualify myself because yeah. i literally started at 17 so i didn't even get to finish school you know like yeah. you know like i was in it before school finished so it was yeah well i feel like anyone who's made it uh two hours and 40 into this <laughs> podcast will have a real appreciation for what skills you have because yeah. there's been a really deep and depth dive into your career and you are really articulate and great speaker and thanks for sharing i can't all of that i can't let you go without talking about new zealand maori sorry oh yeah no that's all right you mentioned that game in 2010 against yeah. england that hucker is the oh. greatest hucker that i've ever seen yeah yeah when i lived Still in Papua new guinea for goosebumps. two years i would watch that to remind me of home yeah what's that particular moment like when you do that hucker um like yeah the whole Maldives team like because like my mum's Maldi um that's where the Maldi comes from and my um and probably where my big bum my big <laughs> hips and that come from that's on <clears throat> mum's side of the family so but I wasn't brought up like I grew up with a lot of Maldives being you know there's quite there's a lot of Maldives in Morrinsville and you know I had a lot of close friends and played rugby with a lot of uh, young Maldi boys growing up um, but I wasn't really brought up in the culture because, you know, mum was very disconnected from it and, yeah, we, she's plastic ash, like, she, she should be white. Um, but, so when I made the Maldives, like, I always want, I knew I was Maldi, I wanted to be, play for the New Zealand Maldives and now it's the Maldi All Blacks, but um, I still call it New Zealand Maldives because it's the New Zealand Maldives, it's not the All Blacks. Um, but that's just me. Same as Sevens, I'll say New Zealand Sevens, not All Black Sevens. Um, because the All Blacks should be the All Blacks. You know, there's that one, there should be one team that has the right to have that in their name. Um, but that's just, that's just me. That's just how I look at it. Um, and I always wanted to play for them, but I was like pretty disconnected, well, very disconnected from my culture and what that was. And I remember I made the squad and they said, oh, you got to, um, do you mean? Yeah, do, yeah, your pepeha. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm yeah. like, okay, like, the hell is that so i'm like ring like because mum's sister she's a bit more in and you know involved and mum's brother they you know they speak to the and that so i yeah, but that's from later in life like that's relationships they ended up in later down in life it wasn't from their upbringing so i took them and you know my auntie helped me you know find out and and get it so and i just remember like having to stand up in front of the team and say it for the first time and just like it's so nerve-wracking like you know you're, you're really worried about the pronunciation and you get guys like Tom D. Ellison who's fluent and he'll just stand up and just like amazing like Hicker Elliott like these guys that can go, we go to a marae and they speak on behalf of the team and they yeah. you know do a full pulfiti and like it's yeah it's pretty cool but I always sort of say like when you play like because you do quite a lot in terms we probably spend like more time like it kind of sounds funny but probably more time on the cultural side than we do the rugby so we look, we do kapak every night so we sing we practice our haka every night you know we're there for like an hour and i remember when i first made the team doing the haka and they're teaching us and you in groups and they break the you know senior guys with some new guys and how we did it back then was you learn and then all of a sudden then the new guys get up and you all hucker but like one of the senior guys will lead it but all the new boys you stand up and you hucker without the other guys with you and that's nerve-wracking because you're all like, oh shit like they're all watching us and they all know what it looks like and what it sounds like so that's pretty nerve-wracking but i suppose boys high probably set us up mm. set me up well for that because i was used to doing the haka yeah. for school and i led the haka for for boys high so that was that was pretty cool um part of you know my school culture so i was pretty comfortable doing a haka but it was it's always nerve-wracking doing it for the first time and doing it in front of people that know it and all these guys that you have heaps of respect for and then how it used to work is that you do it then you break down into sort of a groups of like three i think it was and you'd hucker against each other <laughs> so you'd face each other like you know three newbies and another three <laughs> newbies and you hucker off hucker then off. it goes down to two and then you're one so your solo hucker like one on one 
in front of the whole squad, like management and all. So if, if whenever we huck it, the management are in there, like yeah. your trainers. Because they do it on the field, eh? Oh, the sometimes, trainers, yeah, yeah. I've or they do it on the sideline. Like yeah. they'll do it on the sideline while we're doing it. It doesn't get caught on camera often, mm-hmm. but no, it's pretty you, cool. If when you, you know what you're looking for, you yeah, can yeah, find yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think Wally Rifle did an awesome one. Yeah. Uh, it might have been that England game, or it was if it wasn't that one, it was the Ireland one. And Rotorua, I know he definitely did it. And he, he's in the background going hard by himself. Yeah. But yeah, that's... But that whole team, it's kind of funny because I got interviewed after I got man of the match in the Ireland test. And I remember again, Carl Tanana interviewed me after the game and he talked about it and about the game and, and this and that. And I just said to him, I was like, it's not... It's, it's a different feeling when you play for that team because you're actually connected so you can say brotherhood and this and that, like certain teams, different cultures and whatever it may be. But when you're that, like when you're actually, you have a bloodline mm. to each other, that's different. Like, you know, you see the All Blacks and we're multiracial because that's what our country is. Like we're so diverse. But when you're in that team, you're all moldy. So you're all connected with one thing. And that's quite a powerful, and when you build it up and you're involved in it all week, it sort of nat- naturally sort of takes over mm. and it's almost like you play for this thing that's bigger than yourself and uh, that's probably probably a similar thing for me when I play for Morins it kind of feels like that I kind of feel like I have a responsibility because of what I've achieved to give back to my hometown I guess in a way where this is sort of like you're representing your culture your people like you know probably what the All Blacks feel I don't know because I haven't been in that situation but the, you know they're representing the whole country and where we come from but it's been a moldy in representing that and being a part of that it kind of feels like you're playing almost out of yourself like it, it's got a you can do you, i did things that i couldn't really explain like even in the games like i was like how the hell did i do that and you watch it back and you're like oh that was like that was it almost feels like watching someone else yeah, it's pretty eerie Awesome. Mm-hmm. Dwayne Sweeney, that's been epic. Thanks so much for uh, stopping into our Hamilton studio. Our first rugby guest, Shay, but I think it went pretty well. Yeah, um, yeah, I really enjoyed that. But <laughs> it's, it's, You're a big rugby guy <laughs> these big days, aren't you? Yeah, yeah you, you've got more knowledge than I do. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I might have to take this offline and have a coffee one day. Yeah, Sweeney, that was awesome. You, you might have a future. You, you're so well-spoken you might have a future in the media side of things you know, <laughs> uh, I don't know. there's something there yeah. um yeah thanks so much for coming in sharing your stories um yeah maybe it might be a part two because like i said there's, there's probably a lot left on the table but um thanks again and yeah really enjoyed having you in no awesome thank you very much for having me